back <laughs> what is up give and go viewers it's your boy reynoso that's right your boy reynoso aka portugal poppy back on the set happy to be here it's been a little too long my friend it's been it's a been little a, just a tad too long, too long. <laughs> it's been fucking long man it's been it's, fucking yeah, long yeah, i was yeah. uh i was gone for nine days up in the beautiful coast of Portugal, yeah. enjoying life, really freeing myself of the shackles that is the the uh, overwhelming weight of life. Yeah. Uh, but things are good, though. <laughs> things are yeah. good. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> off the bat, man, I just want to tell everybody, if you've never been to Portugal, it is a must-see destination. Mm. It's, it's literally in a... It's in a renaissance period right now, man. It's a beautiful time right now in Lisbon, Porto, anywhere in Portugal. Uh, it's not that dense with tourists. It's still very beautiful, very That's affordable. Nice. That's really the American nice. dollar goes very far down there, man. Okay. I bu- I like bought like uh, what it was like super box, bro. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I-, I ordered uh, like three they super box for the table, bro, and they ended up paying me to drink it, bro. <laughs> they fucking gave me money, man. <laughs> it was ridiculous, man. It's so cheap, so affordable, and. Yeah. Uh, Really friendly people. So if you're from Portugal and you listen to this show, my respect to your country. Mm, Thank you for mm. having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I might go back, man. I might go back. Maybe we all go Maybe back. Maybe we all go back. The Maybe little we give and go, go shoot in Portugal. Yeah, absolutely, you know? man. Absolutely. Meanwhile, though, across the rest of the footballing landscape in the world, there's been big news with, uh, I guess I'll start here with the, with the, the death of uh, England's queen, Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Passing R. R. away. At uh, 96 years old, really the thing I wanted to point out about uh, her legacy or something that surprised me that's related to football and the Queen is that she lived to see every single World Cup. Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah. When was she she born? She was born in 1926. Wow. And the first World Cup was 1930. So she technically saw every World Cup. No, yeah, no, no, technically. She lived through every single one. Every single one. I was like, Jesus, man, that is a... uh, that's a legacy right there. That, that, that's uh, yeah. It's a hell of a rain right there. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, to any of our English British compatriots, uh, my shout on supporting this time. And we yeah. saw with the Premier League with them uh, postponing adjusting the games, yeah, postponing yeah. games, and uh, really taking a step back to let this moment sort of take its course. Yeah. So absolutely. Absolutely. We move on. Show your respects. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where the fuck do we start, man? <laughs> Dude, I, I don't know, Where but I'm down to start anywhere. The That's the thing. That's the thing. Do we start? Um, I guess I want to start with this because although it's been a while since it's happened, we, we, we as a footballing podcast have to talk about it. Okay. I want to get my two cents in for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Thomas Tuchel. Yeah, it's, uh, honestly, low key, that's where I wanted to start. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah we're on the same chemistry. wavelength that's already. Like, we go yeah. <laughs> Let's Thomas go. Tuchel has been fired from the Chelsea head coaching job yeah. after a number of disappointing results in both the Premier League and the Champions League. And it's stirring a lot of drama, man. It's causing a lot of drama and uproar because of the timing and because of the moves that were made prior to his firing, where a lot of the offseason signings were kind of made because of him, because yeah. of him being there. Obama Young coming in, one of his past players coming into the squad, and he literally plays one game. <laughs> and then he's looking around the locker room like, where's coach? Tuchel, Tuchel. Where'd my coach go? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's start there, man. How do you feel about this whole process and the incoming hiring of the man that we praised just last time that we were together, Graham Potter? Yeah, that's what's crazy. So obviously, Graham Potter, Potter ended up getting that new signature with Chelsea after Tuchel's departure. But dude, what actually what really surprised me about Tuchel's departure is that honestly, it's pretty split 50 50 on whether people agree with the agree with the decision or disagree with it. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are saying that, yeah, Tuchel should have gone because he lost the locker room at that point. And actually that's a great argument because dude, what team has Tuchel not lost a locker room at? His, oh, fi- his final months at Dortmund were sour. Like they had built a really, really good team, but then all of a sudden they just kind of started tanking. Yeah. At least based off of what the results that they were getting. Then we, when he went to PSG, we all know how that ended. He could not manage the superstars. That was the biggest thing about Tuchel leaving. Is that at the end of the day, he could not manage the star power of PSG. Then he goes to Chelsea, wins a goddamn Champions League, uh, takes Chelsea to a new heights once again. And then come the end of his reign here in 2022, 
the big the biggest story is he kind of lost a lot of his players. Yeah. Apparently. Yeah. And I'm just like, dang, it must be Tuchel's management style that leads to this. Maybe he's a little cold with the players. Maybe he's obviously a yeah. genius tactician and it works when he gets there. But after you're with Tuchel for more than 12 months, maybe you start getting fed up with the way he yeah. works, with the way he operates as a manager. So that's interesting. Yeah, because I can't imagine, honestly, when you look at the offensive players, there's only one player that I can truly see being happy with uh, how Tuchel has handled him, and that's Kai Havertz, because for some goddamn reason, outside of him averaging only six goals a Premier League yeah. season, Tuchel continued to start him, yes. continued to give him the opportunity. Yes. And meanwhile, everyone else, I think, is disgruntled with Christian Pulisic, yeah. Hakim Ziyech, uh, Mason Mount. All these players are not playing at their highest level, and I think a lot of them attribute it, attribute it to how Tuchel is managing him in the, in the system. Yeah. And so... I actually can see that point very, very clearly, man. Very, very, very clear, clearly man. that Tuchel has a knack for losing the locker room yeah. and by consequence, losing the team. Exactly. Yeah, once you lose the locker room, you're done as a manager. Yeah. You're done. And then obviously the other side of the coin is that people are saying it's just so early in the season. He got y'all a Champions League in his first year with the team. And honestly, it's like... There's still so much time to salvage the season. There really is, especially with all of the counterparts that he eventually yeah. brought in. Like yeah. he can, st he still could have done something with those players. Sure, they did get off to a shaky season. Obviously, the last draw was that loss against Zagreb. Uh, but I guess the th at the end of the day, I think it's the right decision because mm. of that locker room. Mm. You can't lose your players, man, and then yeah. expect them to go out and fight for you. You can't yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, you can't. Absolutely. The one thing that I don't like though is that. Because Tuchel could not manage his goddamn squad, Brighton lose their best coach in history. Because of Tuchel. Because of Tuchel's, yeah, because yeah. Of Tuchel's failure. Yeah, yeah. Brighton now yeah. lost a really good chance at maybe qualifying for Europe. And that's like yeah. Europa League, Conference League, whatever. Yeah, that a ton of our viewers, because we posted a TikTok praising Graham Potter just a few days before this yeah. uh, firing happened. And so the moment the hiring of Graham Potter to Chelsea happened, we had a bunch of people in our DMs hit me up like, bro, did you see the news? A lot of people, including myself, disappointed with Chelsea's ability to just salvages themselves in this kind of situation, fire Tuchel, proceed to hire Graham Potter, <laughs> yeah. and then set themselves up for what could be a very good future. But now the Brighton fans are in turmoil, man. There's, there's, yeah. there, it's it's low-key depressing because they didn't do anything to deserve this. Nah. The thing I'm seeing from a lot of fans, from a lot of Brighton fans, especially like on their subreddit and everything, I like went in deep to see what yeah. what's their true reaction to losing Graham Potter. Like you said, their greatest coach basically in their history because yeah. of what he's been able to achieve, the records he's broken, and what he's managed to do with this Brighton squad. And a lot of people actually were left a little cold towards Potter because Wait, of, really? first off, for, for just the fact that he was willing to leave the club at that moment in time was a little rough on the fans. But not just that, it's the, uh, the fact that most of the staff that was there, including Brighton legend Bruno, who's coming through the coaching ranks and was suspected to be potentially the replacement for Potter if he were to ever leave, was taken from them as well to join oh, Potter at Chelsea. Okay. So Potter almost had this attitude of like, you know, a selfish attitude, like I'm going to Chelsea, but I'm also going to move my, basically my key staff members yeah. as well. It's it's just a shitty situation shitty. caused by who you mentioned at the very beginning, Tuchel. <laughs> Tuchel, bro. <laughs> that, that's what gets me, man. Yeah. What hurts the most is that Potter won't see the maximized potential of this Brighton squad. Yeah. Nobody will. The fans, the players themselves, because although the players at the end of the day decide the results that they earn, and obviously all the Brighton mm -hmm. players are remaining there, it, it's tough to lose your leader. Yeah. To, to lose the guy who rallies you at halftime, to lose the guy you talk to day in, day out in training. Now it's just going to be so. I, who's it going to be now? Like, they're just going to have to get somebody. And they don't have that power of Chelsea to get a really good coach just like this, just really quickly. They don't have that. Yeah. So it's just shitty, man. But the thing is, when, when I read the news, I was like, Potter has to take this. He has yeah, to. Yeah. He has to. Matt, I, the thing is, Brighton can only go so far just because of the budget that they have. It would take Brighton 10 years to become. Something oh, like a Chelsea, dude. man. Yeah, like, yeah. And 10 years of just nonstop progression, yeah. which is obviously unheard of in today's game. So for, for Potter, this is 
this is the next step in his career, you know? Yeah. He maximized what he could with a squad like Brighton. Now he goes to <laughs> a billion-dollar team in Chelsea, man. I mean, he's got so many good players there. And I'm curious to see how, how he's going to fit in, how he's going to manage these type of players. These, honestly, star power like players with you got Raheem Sterling, mm -hmm. Marco mm -hmm. Corella at the back, you know, mm -hmm. you still have Thiago Silva, Cesar Espeliqueta. How is he going to... How is he going to take this team to that next level, even though they're struggling right now? Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see. I, I, my biggest question for Chelsea, even before the sacking of Tuchel, I think it's the same question that Potter now has to figure out. I associate it a lot to their identity. I don't truly know who Chelsea is. I feel like they almost, <laughs> they almost succeeded way too early in their timeline with them winning the Champions League yeah. and suddenly having that expectation of, you know, having to compete for the Premier League title, having to compete for another Champions League title. Like, I think people assumed and expected a lot more from this Chelsea squad because of what they achieved that one magical season. I was one of those people. And, 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 it, and rightly so. It makes sense. But since then, I think we've kind of seen a lot of confusion across the squad. Yeah. And it's shown, to me, it proves that the, to me, the, the thing that proves that there's this sort of, club wide confusion is is how they've managed transfers this up this past season with how they've just brought in tons and tons of players of insane calibers but still in really really interesting positions yeah. positions that I don't know if really needed replacing for overall I'm just left wondering like what is their identity you look at the top teams Liverpool has a a, a stern identity that they follow a, a clear blueprint of who they are same with Man City you can even look at Manchester United now and how they're starting to implement this sort of ten hog way, this system. That's true. But Chelsea, it's been I would say a couple of years now since that Champions League victory. I don't, I don't, I don't see any sort of identity. I don't see any sort of set system where I can watch eleven random players play and know that they are Chelsea players. I just don't see that yet. And yeah. that's my hope that Potter is able to somehow bring that system in, somehow find a way to mold all these different personalities, all these different egos all at once. Yeah. And my bet is that he does. But for me, that's the most interesting thing going into Potter um, joining the squad. Yeah. And I guess just to end that note, it has been a rough start for Chelsea this season. But kind of what you said at the beginning of what you were just talking about, how the transfers haven't really gone Chelsea's way. And yeah, maybe it is kind of a, a take of mistaken identity where they didn't really know what they wanted, so they just kind of grabbed yeah. some really good caliber players. But not. But even if you take that into account, their transfers just have mainly been downgrades. For me, Koulibaly is a downgrade to Rudiger. Rudiger had a phenomenal two years, these past two seasons at Chelsea. Phenomenal. Koulibaly's been magnificent for Napoli, but so far, yeah. in my opinion... He doesn't match up to Rudiger. He just doesn't. And then you also lose Andreas Christensen, a guy who has been in that back line for Chelsea for several years now. And now he's just also gone. So you just you leave Thiago Silva, who's like 38 years old, mm -hmm. and Cesar Espiliqueta kind of just on an island. Like, where's all of our help? Where are the guys that we used to rely on? You bring in Koulibaly, who is a good defender, but in my opinion, he is a downgrade. Another thing you have to think about is they have not had Conte. And yeah. Golo Conte has been out. Yeah. And that, that is, you know, one of the best defensive midfielders in the Premier League, if not the world, and he's not getting minutes right now because he's injured. So that's a guy, that's another guy gone. And they could not figure out the number nine position. They tried Lukaku. That was a disaster. And they did not refill that exact position this season. So if you really think about it, sure, they've had so many transfers, but none of them have really worked for yeah, Chelsea. Yeah. So I think that coupled with the idea that they don't really have an identity, you get a bunch of confusion out on that pitch, and that's exactly what we've seen at the beginning of the season. So while I was so uh, in the middle of my travels the other day, I was uh, arriving into Boston for a layover. Boston. Boston. Yeah. And uh, first off, man, I was there for like eight hours. Biggest sports city I've seen in the, in the States. Biggest sports city. Tons of jerseys. I'm talking MLS jerseys. Uh, uh, La Liga jerseys, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you know NFL, basketball, and all the, all the and all those things. Yeah. Um. But I arrived at the airport and I'm walking towards like baggage claim, and as I'm walking, I see like a short kind of like, I see a short guy with ridiculous calves, <laughs> massive <laughs> calves, massive calves. Bro. And I look He's at got my, two liters for calves, <laughs> yeah, <bro. laughs> fucking stones. And I look at my girlfriend. I'm like. Uh, that's Taylor. 
And she's like, who the hell is fucking Taylor? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, it's Taylor. Just from the back Just of them? Just from the back, bro. Really? The back. I recognize it so, so, no way. so easily, man. That's I recognize it was Taylor Twelman, man. Mm. Taylor Twelman, uh, for those who don't know, is a pretty popular American soccer pundit now. He used to play for the American national team. Yeah, yeah. And um, honestly, one of my favorite pundits and one of yours as well. Yes, bro. Um, because in terms of the impact that a pundit can have, I think Twelman has had one of the most impactful tenures as a pundit yeah. um, with how he went off on the national team back when they didn't qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. He was the guy who the following hours after that final U.S. loss um, went off on the national team, went yeah. off on ESPN, just let them have it, but also made really great points as to why uh, things, things that the USA needs to work on with their academies, their pay-to-play system, um, the, the way players are trained nowadays, the philosophy, yeah, yes. just the, the general infrastructure of the U.S. men's national team was um, put at the stake by Taylor Twelman. And for me, that gained, I, that gained a lot of my respect because mm. it's, it's what I think they needed. And we're seeing now that they're, they're a much better place now. So I'm not saying that's because of Taylor, <laughs> but I am saying that he yeah. was a part of that, that movement and that push. And yeah. so... I've had a good amount of respect for Taylor Twellman. Uh, you yourself have, have claimed that you have been a, a big Taylor Twellman fan. Huge Taylor Twellman fan, man. And kind of just to echo what you said, the, the reason why I think he's my favorite American pundit specifically is because he truly does have an intimate relationship with the MLS and the U.S. men's national team. He knows the infrastructure. He knows the players. He knows how they think. Well, almost as if he's there, like yeah. he's there every day, like training with them or like somehow in the coaching staff. He just has that knowledge. But to couple with that knowledge, he has the passion. He has that passion to really just say what's on his mind. And so it's so entertaining to watch because you know he's not just saying the things that yeah. he says because he's being told to. Yeah. He truly believes everything that comes out of his mouth. And to me, I have nothing but respect for a person who does yeah. that. And so Coleman makes the game that much more fun to watch, especially in a landscape where we don't have that many American mm -hmm. pundits for soccer specifically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I fucking love Twelman. Yeah. <laughs> so basically all those things ran through my head while I saw him. Right, I'm while I'm seeing him in the far distance, and I see him like shit, man. I respect this guy. What the fuck do I do? Do I tell him about the give and go? Do I just ask for a photo? <laughs> what do I do, man? I start getting all nervous. Like, tap man. Me on the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. We're like on these escalators going down, and I actually he's like with a group of two other people. Okay. And I'm like right there behind him. I'm eavesdropping on their conversation, and I immediately <laughs> I immediately notice and recognize the voices of the two other guys. I realize that they're. Uh, go to ESPN commentators for any sort of MLS match. I don't know their names, oh, but I okay. recognize their voices immediately. Yeah, yeah. Immediately. And then once okay. I really got a good look at them, I'm like, oh, I've seen them like pregame. Yeah. Like I've seen these guys. Okay. And so here I am behind like an ESPN posse. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just, I wait for a moment and I go for it. Right. I'm all nervous and shit, but I just go up to Taylor. I'm like, hey man, uh, you, uh, t you, you Taylor Twelman? <laughs> and like midway through my sentence, he turns around. He already knows. He already, ah, knows, he already knows what's going on. <laughs> like, um, and, you know, understandably so, he just kind of treats me as a fan, which yeah. I was in the moment. Absolutely. And he's just like, yeah, man, let's get that selfie going. Let's get this selfie and let's do it. Yeah, yeah. And then I just pull out my phone, uh, selfie camera, selfie mode, quick photo. But he was just, it's like he, he like he's gone, through the, he's gone through the rhythms of interacting with a fan. And so yeah. he was just putting me through that mill, bro. He's just putting me through it. I couldn't say shit. Yeah, step I was one. Like, oh, I was just like, fuck, fuck. Yeah, I'll do whatever you want. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we got the photo, shook hands. He was like, uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, man, big fan of you. And he was just like, I appreciate that. And then he just kind of walked off. So, yeah. really didn't get a chance to, to pitch him the give and go or anything, but. Afterwards, I DM'd on Instagram, so maybe there's something there. He saw our Instagram story, and so he knows. He might know. I would love to pick that man's brain one day. Oh, one Just day. give me one, one give me one day. hour with that man. Yeah, that'd one be day, so fun, man. man. I would love it if we could ever have him as a guest on this show. I'm saying this now so that our fans who follow us now, the moment that they see Taylor Twilman on this show, <laughs> it'll mean it'll a be lot. A monumental moment, bro. <laughs> monumental. Are we uh, are we gonna talk about the massacre Holland is <laughs> doing right now, man? Are you going to acknowledge yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's um, slaughtering every single the, the, team he faces, The slaughter? The, yeah. the, the, it's crazy. The murders he's committing in the fucking Premier League, dude? Mm-hmm. Um, 
we gonna talk about it or are we good we just gonna move on to the next topic we can just move on to the next topic man we i'm even... specifically i'm gonna wait till he hits that 30 goal mark oh, in the premier league God, i'm gonna wait because it, famously or yep. infamously yep. however you want to put it no. i was certain in my point of view that holland was going to reach 30 goals in the premier league yeah and you know obviously polemic ensues uh, oh, debate lot, d- debates begin and it is what it is but i was certain and still am certain obviously that holland is going to hit that 30 goal mark in his first season at manchester city in the premier league i'm going to wait i'm going to wait to dive into that point until he hits that 30 goal mark and it's uh, only it's only going to be a matter of yeah, time yeah. it's not a matter of if it'll be like on tuesday bro <laughs> exactly bro <laughs> it's just it's only a matter of time that's mm-hmm. all it is yeah. and once that point hits i'll go in yeah, man. Uh, I mean, I got to give you your credit. Um, not for the 30. Well, rather, I, I got to give you credit because that was one of our most controversial takes going into this season. Oh, yeah. uh, we posted it like on TikTok and Instagram. And, you know, those those two sites always generate such uh, uh, such a controversial atmosphere. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely. On TikTok, especially, man, the comments we saw on that one were ridiculous for that. No, for that. Just that clip of you saying 30 goals. I think the top comment on that one was... Uh, this is why people shouldn't have podcasts. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, bro. Yeah. Because yeah. now we are what, like, uh, seven games into the season, and he's already in double digits. Yeah. And Last just, right, six yeah, games, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. it's six, and he's and already in double digits. Yeah, I like this little uh, this assassin-like approach you're taking of just staying quiet, <laughs> stay quiet until the moment comes. Because, dude, that was one <laughs> bold prediction that doesn't look so bold now, man. Well, and that's the thing. It could have been. It could be forty. If you go back to that video, I looked. <laughs> If you go back to that video, the way that I said Holland was going to hit 30 yeah, goals yeah. was as if I had already mm-hmm. seen it happen. There's a 30 goal gap that is missing when you lose Gabriel Jesus and Raheem Sterling, but they immediately replace it with a 30 goal monster in Erling Holland. There is no doubt in my mind, none, that he's going to get minimum 30 goals just in the Prem. He's that good. And he has the tools around him to make it an even easier job for him. When you have De Bruyne feeding you, you're never going to be hungry. You're never going to be hungry, bro. And the thing is, that's how I felt. I Mm -hmm. knew he was going to hit 30. He's going to hit 30. Mm -hmm. And we'll get more into it when he does. But I got to pull back a little because your boy Jack Grealish ain't looking too good. Yeah. That that looks the actually complete opposite. Yeah. But to be fair, it's not because of how he's performed, but because he just hasn't. Pep just hasn't given him that 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 full freedom that we thought he was gonna get gauging from the preseason. Yeah, it still it still does appear, and it, it does make sense that Pep truly does prefer Foden. He yeah. just prefers him. Yeah. And the thing is, in preseason, we didn't see Phil Foden because he didn't get vaccinated, so he couldn't come to the states. Oh shit! I didn't yeah, know yeah. That. yeah. So we just physically could not see Foden play in preseason. So we just saw a lot so of pe- Jack. Pe- Pep bamboozled you, bro. <laughs> yeah, bro. He did. He did. We saw a lot of Jack in the preseason, man. So I was like, oh, shit, if he plays like this. But now we barely see him now. Yeah. But it's, it's just yeah. one of those things where it's just like, you could also say Can't the same right thing about everything. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we. it's just one of those signings where it's just like, where does Jack fit into this team? Re- realistically, same thing with Calvin Phillips. We said yeah, we, bro. we we actually got that one right. We said where is he going to fit in this team because he's not going to start over Rodri, Gundogan, or De Bruyne. Yeah. He's just not. And then you still have like Bernardo Silva likes to play center mid too with Pep. So out of those four players, man, Phillips is the fifth choice <sighs> by far. Fuck. So he's just never in the game like time. Unnecessary depth. It's unnecessary, like, man. That, man. They don't even need it. Like. Honestly, even though Leeds ended up getting Mark Roca and Tyler Adams with that money, mm-hmm. uh, they still could have probably used the likes of yeah. Phillips. Or, or or another team that's just above Leeds could have used a guy like Phillips. Like, City don't need him, man. Yeah. They they really don't. So And the, you could argue that they don't need Jack Grealish. Yeah. They don't. Yeah. So many other teams in the Premier League could use both of those players. Yeah. So it's just, it's just one of those annoying things where when you have too much money, what do you do with it? Yeah, and then to the last point is that they added uh, Akanji from uh, oh, Dortmund, too. I saw too. that, too. It's another one and I was it's just like, like, for God, what, bro? For what? Like, now you're just being an asshole. Now you're just being an asshole. You don't, yeah. Like, Jesus Christ, man. They don't need yeah. that, man. And Nathan Ake, I know he's a, mm-hmm. got a little injured right now, but he started off the season really... Really well, mm-hmm. and he he ended up 
slotting in that center back position as if he had always played there for his entire career. He's got that pep effect where he's just more comfortable on the ball. He's a better passer because of it too. Yeah. And now they're just going to build a kanji into another pep trooper. <laughs> that, that, that's just the idea now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, again, it is what it is, but it's just so unnecessary, man. Yeah. Especially when you know guys like us who really like parody across football, this is just the opposite of that. Yeah. And the last thing I want to say on Holland, dude, is uh, I pray, man. I pray. The only thing remaining for him that's in the way of him stopping a 30, potentially 40 goal season. 40, I pray. bro? I pray. I pray ah, for health. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I pray for... Pray for his health. Pray for his pray health. For his health. Uh, <laughs> up to this point, <laughs> nearly every season in Holland's career, at some point he misses about 10 games. Yep. Yep. Um, I pray. I pray that he can somehow bypass that. Maybe that Man City luck of just always really truly being healthy. That kind of seems to be a a pattern in their system. Dude, that is so Players true. Players just stay healthy. It's very that rare that, that like, yeah, that, that, that is so true. Yeah. Very rare that a player on Manchester City is like gets a really serious injury. Yeah, man. Like a, an important one. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember begging, bro, for fucking like... Uh, like Bernardo Silva to not be at like at one of the Liverpool games. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? like, yeah, just yeah. Always was available. He's got a little muscle injury or something, yeah, but yeah, never, 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 bro, never. Um, and so right now it seems it seems good in that sense. It seems like they're managing him really well. And so yeah. I pray. But if he do, if he stays healthy, man, that's that's thirty to forty goals, bro. Dude, that's record breaking. Imagine imagine if he gets even close, like 38, 39. Imagine if he gets close to 40, yeah, dude. Yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Dude, and like, if he breaks 40? That's what I'm saying, man. That would be... Uh, honestly, that would be unimaginable. When you think, like, that's when crazy. You think about it, what would it take for a player to actually be able to achieve that in the Premier League? When you think about the team that player has to be on, it kind of makes sense, man. Like yeah. It would be a Man City team that can score five past basically any team any outside team. Of, like the top three. Yeah. yeah. Like they, That's yeah. what it would take. Yeah. And so if he can become a part of those slaughterings, those murders... Uh, I don't see. I don't there. see how. Yeah, I don't see how he how he, how he doesn't get up there. Yeah. So no Premier League games this past weekend. No Premier League games this past and weekend. And so my focus basically shifted over to Serie A. Oh yeah. And I feel like there's a lot to talk about there, oh, man. Bro, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because I'm truly, I guess, fascinated with how Serie A has played out so far, and kind of the way that the season is shaping out to be in this league. It's truly fun, man. Yeah. It's truly fun with how many teams could potentially be contenders. You sprinkle in the they're calling it the nuke at Naples. The uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, the right. Duke at Naples, yeah. man, with Na- Napoli beating Liverpool four one. You sprinkle in that kind of that kind of storyline happening with Napoli on right. the rise. Roman Jose Mourinho's incredible just management of his team. AC Milan defending their championship, yeah. coming in strong as well. Uh, with Rafa Leao being a stud, Ooh. as you mentioned in the past podcast. Yeah. Weird underdogs like Udinese just yeah. kind of staying in the what are they the third mix. third right yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. Juventus struggling, struggling. Weird results. Inter, Inter Milan, yeah. Inter Milan coming in pretty strong as well. That's like seven teams at this point that yeah, I mentioned man. that have, that have cool like narratives and storylines attached to them and potential title hopes. What gets me about this is I have yet to see a team say we want this title this year. Milan had a really good start. And obviously they got that really big win against Inter Milan in, in that in that derby, yeah, but yeah. They've, they've also dropped some points where they, yeah, they, they just tied. absolutely shouldn't have. Yeah. Napoli too, like there'll be games where Napoli score two, three goals, look absolutely dominant. I'm like, okay, good. Let's see the same thing next week against another similar mid-table team, and they'll draw like nil-nil. Mm. That actually happened, I think, two weeks ago. And obviously, like you said, Juve, who have a really, really good squad, yeah. not maximizing it whatsoever, so they're off to a shaky start. But but that's the thing, since. Teams like Napoli, Inter, Milan, who have all gone out to decent starts, since they've all lost and dropped points, Juve, they're not that far off the kilter, man. I mean, they're right there. <laughs> they're yeah. right there. Yeah, they're still, yeah, they're still very much in the race. Exactly. Yeah. And like I, I remember Roma, they got an incredible draw against Juventus where they had to fight back, have a stellar second half performance. And I'm like, okay, this is a good Roma team. And then the next week they got they got romped. And there's lost. I'm like, how does the team fight like that mm-hmm. against Juve on the road? Then the very next week, just lose. Like, if you have that fight, I need to see it week in, week out. So that's my ultimate point is, 
What team is going to take the initiative and say, this is going to be our title this year? Haven't seen it yet. I'm curious to see how this goes. Maybe it's really nice. <laughs> maybe they, maybe they're like, you know what? If no, if none of these other teams yeah, want it, we'll yeah. take it. My thing is, bro. I don't think that's that negative of a thing because if you could pick one league for mm. there to be this sort of parity that we're seeing, yeah. kind of with like seven potential title contenders, yeah. it's Italy, especially with how if you ultimately tie on points. You go to a one-game playoff to decide a title. <laughs> that's what this is sounding like it's shaping up to be, man. Dude. That's what they, that's what's happening. Because if there's uh. if there's one team that steps up and just goes for the title, we get removed of that. Right. And so with it being the first year that they're actually allowing that rule in, I'm a little like I'm I'm person. That's what personally excites me about this this start. I know we haven't seen that giant. Uh, propel themselves just yet and maybe we will it's very early it is it's it very is. early yeah, yeah, you're maybe right we you're will right. you're right um but for now i'm very content and uh, oh it's been so entertaining yeah, that's for sure yeah. i'm not complaining yeah. <laughs> um between napoli atalanta milan udinese roma inter lazio and juventus that's oh, the top eight right lazio there too yeah um how about we do a quick prediction who do you have i guess finished winning the title so far as at this point Who's your title winner as of right now, September, oh, mid-September? Shit. Who wins the Serie A? I think it's going to come down to Napoli and Milan. Mm. But what's crazy, and I know they haven't maximized themselves yet, I could see Juve doing something this mm. year. Their squad is actually hella stacked, man. Mm-hmm. And as I said, uh, I th- was it two weeks ago now when I was talking about Juve, they have some really interesting players, man. Miretti looks really creative on the ball. You still, they just got Leandro Paredes from PSG. He's been doing great. Once he gets involved, yeah, once like he gets comfortable, great. man, he's going to be the general of Juve, Juve's midfield. And then you add in Pogba? Paredes and Pablo could have a hell of a duo in the center of the park for Juve, man. You have Angel Di Maria. And then if they can somehow find a way to feed Dusan Vlahovic, Juve could, this could be a title winning team, man. Yeah, man. And so I think it'll come down to those three teams. Even, again, even though Juve have gotten to, off to a shaky start, if they can figure it out, Juve will be up there. Ultimately, if I had to pick one, I, I think I'd like to see Napoli win it. I would. This is probably the time to do it yeah, when everyone yeah. else can't figure it out. Napoli, who've gotten off to a good start, if they can just keep this going, I think they could do something this year. And that'd be yeah. fun to see, dude. I uh, the the thing with Juve for me is that uh, I don't think they'll figure it out soon enough, man. They're mm. gonna. I think Allegri's the next one, the next oh, big yeah? coach, big name coach to uh, mm. be fired. The Juve fans I'm seeing online are just not happy with the way he's managing that team. And like you said, you you, you said it yourself that if they can find a way to feed Vlahovic, man. Yes. When I watch Juve play, man. It, it's it's a little depressing. It's actually very frustrating, especially like it's in that PSG game. Yeah. So many times now, and you can see it in Vlahovic's body language. Like he gets frustrated, man. Like the decisions that the fullbacks and that the wide <laughs> midfielders are making just aren't giving him what he wants. Mm-hmm. They won't put him in good positions. He's like out there trying to win the ball against three defenders. <laughs> Sometimes he looks he looks like he's on an island at yeah, times, man. Yeah, yeah. And although I, I I truly think he's the best talent that Juventus has right now, they have to find a way to maximize him. Otherwise. I think they'll finish they'll finish top six for sure. But I don't see them as title contenders until they can figure that out. And I think that doesn't happen until Allegri gets fired. Yeah. And so it's a matter of time of when that happens for me. Unless Allegri somehow finds a way to just change up what he's done so far, uh, which I don't think will happen. So yeah. for me, I ah, damn man, I did I hate it when we when we agree on fucking shit because we're supposed to <laughs> bring in different views and perspectives. Yeah, man. Not for me, uh, <laughs> the way Napoli has started has just, I mean, it's, it's, how could you not pick, how could you not pick, you not pick contenders them. right yeah, now? They're yeah. insanely hot right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think about those teams, that Napoli team of the past with like Mertens, Insigne, Milik. Hamshik. Hamshik. Yeah. Um, and you think about how talented that team was, but how. And Cavani. Cavani too. as well. Yeah. yeah. But how it was never truly, there was never truly a moment of potentially being a title contender because of how dominant Juve was during that time. Exactly. It's kind of interesting how now suddenly the door is wide open yeah. uh, with really one of the few artifacts from that old squad being Chucky Lusano. Lusano. <laughs> 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 you have this golden opportunity now with the team that I, I, I think what I'm getting at is that it just is, it's just a little unexpected to see them have a chance at the title all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, but you have to buy in. You, they, they have to recognize that they have they the talent to, to do man. it. And yeah. they can. So like you said at the beginning, 
Uh, if they can take the title into their own hands and really secure it early on, would love to see that, man, because Napoli has not celebrated a title in a long time. Long and time, man, man, after seeing how they performed against Liverpool and how that crowd was just fired up, I would love to I would love to see Napoli win a title, man. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Atalanta? Honestly, aren't they aren't they kind of right there too? They're second, yeah. Yeah, they were, they were in first right there. until Napoli just played like yeah, before yeah. the game. Um it's largely the same team that we saw dazzle in the Champions League, what, two, two years ago now? Two, three years two, ago? Two, three, yeah. yeah, two, yeah. Three. It's largely the same team. Obviously, they've had to make some adjustments with what Romero mm-hmm. going to Tottenham for other leaving. So they've had to get just a couple of other players just to come into the squad, fill that void. Um, but they've done it. They've done it well. It's it's largely the same DNA. It's the same coach. Gasperini is still pretty much playing the exact same system. My only thing with Atalanta is it just hasn't worked in the past. And it's, again, it's the same style of play. It's largely the same players. And the players that they have replaced are play like a, a similar vein. I know they just got actually a guy from Udinese to fill in that uh, left wing back role mm-hmm. because Goosens, uh, he left and they bring in Brandon Sopi from Udinese. Again, very similar player, likes to go forward. Mm-hmm is fine tracking back, very athletic, very forward-thinking type of player. So it's the same system for Atalanta. But for me, it just has not worked. And it, and the thing is, they were in a time where Juve finally were on the decline. Juve weren't winning titles when Atalanta came through. It was Inter Milan and then eventually AC mm-hmm. Milan winning these titles. And in both of those years, Atalanta were very competitive, score, uh, playing high-flying football, scoring a lot of goals every game. But at the end, they just faltered. They ended up like third, fourth place at, at the end of every season. And it's just not enough. And I'm going to go ahead and say I think it's going to be the same thing for Atalanta this year, especially when you compare them to maybe the consistency or the firepower that Napoli can have in the long run. I don't know if Atalanta can keep up over the course of a 38-game season because yeah. they have not shown that they've been able to. So, yeah, yeah that's my take on them. Yeah, that, that Champions League Atalanta team was fun, though. You super that? fun, super fun. Oh, abso- yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was pretty fun. They had a good run. Um, I don't know. I, I'd like to see them sustain sustain what they have going on right now i think they can but maybe it's maybe not enough to win but maybe now they have the experience maybe now that's true because of because of the failures they have in their past maybe they can overcome those those situations let's be optimistic here okay Mm -hmm. they also (laughs) still don't have they they also lost papu gomez Mm -hmm. a couple years Mm -hmm. ago to sevilla Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah they again they're off to a hot start they are (laughs) but so are a lot of other teams. a lot of teams that's right that's right right and some teams are gonna have to falter at some point exactly and i think atalanta would be one of those teams Mm -hmm. to falter a little bit i'm not saying they go 10th or 11th but i don't see them getting close to the title Mm -hmm. once we're in that 30 32 game part of the season yeah yeah but ac milan man yeah no they could do something because they they actually have the exact same team minus frank cassie essentially yeah yeah. so for them it's just a matter of consistency and belief within each other because they've already proved that they can do it yeah and they certainly can do it again yeah and the like we pointed out the rise of rafael lao i I keep mentioning him but only because of how um threatening he's looked this to start the season bro i saw a hot take on twitter but i actually didn't rule it out completely where someone was like if Lau continues at this level for the next two months, is there a fair and real argument for Lau starting over Ronaldo? <laughs> <laughs> Especially if Ronaldo isn't doing shit up until that point. Right. No. No, I think ultimately no. Ultimately no. Who's the other winger for Portugal? Let's say it is Ronaldo. <laughs> Who who starts right now? Isn't it like uh, technically Jota, but he's injured? Yeah. Maybe yeah. maybe Santos finds a way to just play Leao inverted and play him on the yeah. other side. Yeah. And just put Ronaldo where he usually plays, Leao on the other side, and they figure it out. Yeah. Because it, that's got to work. <laughs> maybe. Well, yeah. It's just, yeah. Well, yeah, don't they put Joao Felix up there sometimes? Or Bernardo Silva? Felix doesn't start that much yeah. for Portugal. He yeah. But he, he always plays, but yeah. usually off the bench. Yeah. Usually. He's that hot. He's oh, that no, hot yeah, where, he's hot. Where, he's hot. Where, is that hot to where Fernando Santos actually has a decision to make that he didn't know he had to make like a year ago? <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So, suddenly, like, paperwork showed up to his table, and he's like, oh, shit. I got <laughs> to figure this out. What is this out. about? It, like, it involves Ronaldo, and he's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> What's but, interesting, yeah. though, is that Leao is, 
he's like a winger, but he's also a forward. I'm not saying mm-hmm. he's a number nine, but there could be some sort of system where maybe yeah. Leao plays a little bit more centrally than he's used to. That way they could figure out how to play Ronaldo out wide and where Ronaldo can play more like a feeder feeder mm-hmm. type of role. Or maybe the, the opposite. Ronaldo has played centrally plenty yeah, of times yeah, in his career. And if it means that Leao gets to be more effective out on the wing... Santos has a lot, a lot of work to do to figure this out, but I think there is a way to play both of them, or maybe he does have to make the big decision to yeah. choose who he wants to yeah. play. You know, when you went to Costa Rica, you had a really good takeaway about Costa Rican football. Yeah. I kind of wanted to approach Portugal in the same way, see what I could learn from, or just kind of gather from that country and the way that they do football around those parts. Mm. And one thing that I think is at the forefront for Portuguese soccer is the usage of the buy and sell strategy in the sense of how Porto, um, Benfica, and even sometimes, you know, Sporting CP, Sporting, no, yeah. maybe even Braga, um, have a knack for developing talent, selecting talent from uh, oftentimes South America, and then selling for a, a lot of money, man. Big money. A lot of money. And we've had we've had our thoughts on kind of that concept with, like, for example, RB Salzburg and how they approach it. Yes. Uh, Dortmund and how they approach it in the Bundesliga. But for me something feels different about how Portugal does it specifically because the teams that do it oftentimes reach quarterfinal levels of the Champions League. Mm. They go on somewhat deep runs. Yes, they never come close to that semifinal really or to a final as well. But it's interesting to think about the balance that they have of providing really good Champions League results while simultaneously selling talent basically every single year. Um, you look at the two biggest ones, FC Porto and Benfica, bro. They've sold millions, damn near billions dollars worth of players oh, in dude. recent memory. Yes. Um, Benfica, I think, is one of those teams that you could do a a starting eleven of what would they look like if they had not not sold their players, yeah. and you would have an incredible star studded squad. Um, yeah, and dude, I mean, what, in the last two years, last like two, oh, okay, yeah? okay, sorry, in the last three years or four, I guess if you want to say, Darwin Nunes and Joao Felix have given them. 200 like 200 million 200 million two players yeah, two and they million. have 200 yeah. million dollars because of those yeah. guys and even the names that, that i've that i've gotten from like that i've seen that have gone through the ranks they're like ederson ederson was there yeah, at one point yeah renato sanchez renato sanchez yeah. um there's a whole list but I, i'm just going off the head right now yeah um uh, but it's ridiculous man it's ridiculous, ridiculous. The, the reason i bring it up is because i'm just i know we harped on dortmund for how they do it but dortmund sells and they don't win domestic titles Right. Um, RB Salzburg sells. They do win domestic titles, but they don't do anything in Champions League. Here in Portugal, we have a situation where the teams that sell do win the domestic titles, whether it's between Porto and Benfica. And then they don't really disappoint in the Champions League uh, in the sense of that they usually somehow find a way to make it into the final eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was wondering, what are your thoughts on kind of what Portugal has managed to do? Because... The way I've seen it, I was looking at like YouTube videos and like what Portuguese people thought about this sort of concept, and they seem really proud of it. Like they seem to be really like proud of the fact that they are known for that and that this system tends to work for them. And so, in a way, they're satisfied with the results that they get from this concept and the way that they approach football there. Yeah. But I'm wondering, what are your thoughts and uh, kind of like the the long long form scope of Portugal? Is this is this ultimately a good thing or should they aim to achieve even more within their league and, and the Champions League? For me, I think it's the best that the Portuguese league can do. So they're maximizing their profits, their visibility, their broadcasting rights, whatever they can maximize, the Portuguese league is doing everything that they can and they're doing it mm-hmm. right. The reason why I don't criticize the Portuguese league and maybe I criticize the Bundesliga a little bit is because Germany has the culture the tradition and the history of very successful football clubs. Not just one, not just two, so many. There's so many stories of just German clubs having, you know, big dynasties in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Then obviously you have teams like Dortmund, teams like Bayern Munich, who have, you know, especially Bayern, have dominated the landscape of Europe for decades, right? And not only that, they are self-proclaimed, and UEFA has proclaimed the Bundesliga as being a top five league. Yes, yes. The Portuguese league is just outside of that. To me, the way I see the Portuguese league is they can't achieve that, you know? Other than maybe Benfica and Porto 
because honestly, recently sporting has actually gotten up to that higher level where like English pundits know who sporting is now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like obviously probably yeah. in the eighties and seventies, it was just like, I, I remember Benfica was really popular yeah. apparently like back in the sixties, I think, or something like that. And so, yes, there are historic clubs in Portugal, but as a league, as a tradition, as a history, the Portuguese doesn't have that. So what do they do? Well, they, they just try and craft these teams that can be highly competitive they scout really well, like you said, in South America, but also in Africa too. And from there, they plan to build them, train them into really good European footballers, and then they give them off and sell them for big bucks to the top five leagues. Yeah. And so I think it's all you can do. The way I see the Portuguese league is like the port to Europe. Literally. Yeah. Literally. And mainly for South American players. Exactly. Bro. Mainly. And the thing is, the South American America, at this point, Players in South America, players in North America. I know a couple of Hondurans have actually tried to go to Portugal. And a lot of Africans do play in Portugal. When they get that phone call, when their agents call them, like, look, you have a chance to go play in Portugal. Based off of all the players that we've just named that have done it before them, they're like, this might be my opportunity. Uh This might be my chance. I do well in Portugal. I go to Spain after this. I go to Italy. I go to Germany. I go to England. Something like that. Maybe even France. You know, so they know that they, they, that that reputation that Portugal has built is so apparent now yeah. in football and culture yeah. that players know it, coaches know it, agents know it. So I think I think it makes sense. Yeah. They're maximizing everything that they can, especially in the profits. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. And it's it just even better that the scouting system at Benfica and Porto is so good that they can that's compete ridiculous, in Europe. Bro. It's ridiculous. That, that's Yeah. That's like the caveat that they That's actually the caveat, yeah. are able to have really good teams, maybe for not long yeah, terms just, of time, yeah. but for that one season that they yeah. have them, it's magic, man. Yeah. And it's usually really good. I th- also think this is what separates them uh, from like a league like Netherlands, I feel like. I feel like you know there's a top five, but I think Portugal is six. I, I don't see any other league coming into, into that position. Yeah. Um, I think Netherlands comes close, but I just don't think there's enough. Even though there isn't much in Portugal, I think there's more depth in Portugal than there is in the Netherlands with really just Ajax at this point um, having a shot at Champions League and also selling players that are capable of going beyond the uh, Dutch league. And so uh, for me, Portugal is on the move. Do you see the, do you see the Portuguese league cracking the top five? Possibly, possibly, but it would take a lot for that to happen. It would take like, it would take, for example, PSG having a bad European year because as long as one the team like makes it Fran- the fall of France, <laughs> the fall of France, <laughs> it would take the fall of League One for <laughs> Portugal to actually go up into yeah. the top five because yeah. all you need is one team to make a deep run and you get a lot of UEFA points for that. Yeah. So since PSG usually make it to the quarters mm. and if they make it to the semis and finals, that'll keep France in the top five for sure, even if the rest of the French clubs yeah. drop out on the group stage. So that it's just tough that for Port- tough. it's, it's yeah. tough for Portugal to compete solely because PSG right now are just you know god tier yeah. type of club um but yeah to i guess to go back to that ix point or the dutch point um what's interesting about the edit of is that it is very similar in the sense that ix have an incredible knack of scouting these young talents yeah, from man. across the world building them to these incredible european talents and then selling them for a lot of money but it kind of it kind of ends there you know it yeah. is Obviously, there are other points where maybe like a, a player from Feyenoord or a player this, or, or a player from PSV get that big money move, but it's a lot less rare. Whereas, like mm-hmm. you really do see a lot of movement from both Porto and Benfica, mm-hmm. and more recently Sporting, Sporting as yeah. well. And not only that, I think another thing is that Portugal are completely open to having the most diverse nationalities in their oh, league. They yes. get everybody. There's, I, there's a Japanese player playing in Sporting right now. <laughs> I remember they last, get everybody. Yeah, last year uh, when we were previewing the knockout stages of the Champions League, I remember the one thing that stood out to me about Benfica was how diverse. So they, diverse. they started four different nations <laughs> at the back. And I was like, bro, what the fuck? How are they talking well, to I was each like, other? Dude, where are the Portuguese players at? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they are not afraid to just bring yes. in whoever is willing to fulfill those needs. Yes. And it makes sense because it, it pays out for them ultimately. Yeah. Tucumán update. Uh, Tucumán update? Tucumán update. They're still in first. They're still somehow in first. But you know what I've noticed, bro? <laughs> What's up? I feel like other Argentinian teams are now preparing for Tucumán specifically uh, and in a way sort of targeting them in yeah. the way that you would a, a, a potential winner. Right. You know, and that's part of the phase of, that's part of the stage of, of going for a championship is that these teams are starting to realize like, oh, okay, you think you can win first in the league. Well, now you're going to get our best effort. Yeah. And we're seeing it now because 
they're struggling to win games now. They dropped a lot of points. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe not a lot of losses, but no. definitely a lot of draws. No. no, I think they they lost to Boca, and I think that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in, in the like, last like four games or something like yeah, that. Yeah, understandable. My biggest thing with Tucumán in that whole situation is I still have faith because even though they've dropped a considerable amount of points in the last, like, let's say, six, seven games, so have everybody else underneath them. They've lost the exact same amount of points because when I first brought them up, they were only like two points ahead. And right now it's, what, a one-point lead? Really nothing's changed over the last That's nine right. yeah. games. Yeah. So, yes, Tucumán have found that inconsistency, but other teams who maybe were consistent – are also finding that inconsistency mm-hmm. too. It's just a competitive league. It is what it is. But yeah, it's still tight as hell. <laughs> and these last nine games are going to be insane yeah. because, as you said, Tucumán know yeah. how much weight each point is going to bear, and so will their opponents. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say the only team that actually has changed is Boca, bro. They were a, at a way lower spot 10 games ago. Now, yeah. with, now, we're the, now they're within two points, right. and they got a win against Tucumán, and they got a win against River Plate, which is going to do so much for them yeah. mentally. Mm-hmm. So there is this sort of fearfulness I have, this... You could say looking over the shoulder <laughs> shit, bro. I'm like, God damn it, man. If They're I'm coming. Cool, they, yeah, They're like, coming. Like, you can't do what you did these past 10 games. You can't replicate that now. Yeah, probably know? not. No, you know? probably not. Like, yeah, now, yeah. now it's showtime. Like, I just, like yeah, they yeah. got lucky. Everyone else, as, as you said, kind of did the same thing. Yep. But going into these next 10 games. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get a shit together. You got to get a shit together, man. So that's the fucking Tucumán update, man. Uh, shit's, shit's rocky it's right now. It's getting tight. Yeah. It's yeah. getting real tight down there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this upcoming weekend, we actually have a uh, banger of a matchup in the sense that these two teams are lining up to face each other. And I don't know if these two teams have ever been in such good form at the same time. Those two teams are Chivas and America. Ah. El Clásico Mexicano. Is this weekend? This weekend. Atlético and Real Madrid are playing this weekend, oh, too. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Two big Clásicos. Yeah, two big ones. Jeez. Holy shit. Um, but to kind of go off what I just said, Chivas is playing incredible, bro. <laughs> bro, did you see that <laughs> Alexis Vega goal? <laughs> oh, my Magisterial. God. Magisterial. Magisterial, bro. I'm t- Alexis Vega. Is going through a rise right yeah, now. Yeah, I know he is. Because I is. thought what we saw last year from Vega was, not that it was it, but I was like, okay, that's good enough. I thought that was it. I think he's just going <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think he could get any Bro, better, No, man. no, he's getting better, dude. He, he is. is getting so... He's so effective. He is so Europe ready, in my opinion. Mm. And he's guiding this Chivas team to what is now their seventh undefeat... Seventh game without a defeat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is crazy considering how the season started, man. We were asked to start the season. Yeah, I didn't yeah. see any hope. I saw no light at the end of the tunnel. And then suddenly we just started stringing out these victories, man, back to back. But it's not the fact that we're pulling off these wins because at times in Liga MX you can just get lucky a few yeah, games and get results. It can happen a lot. The way that they're forming these goals, the way that they're generating opportunities, the yeah. way that they're linking up with Saldivar up top, Beltran in that midfield being a little sneaky weasel, man. Mm-hmm. Our backline actually looking somewhat formidable now. Really good defense. One of the least go- amount of goals allowed in Liga MX so far. Yeah. And now I believe the seventh seed in the league Bro, I am buzzing as a Chivas fan, bro. Yeah, buzzing. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, bro. And then I look across the state line to our bitter rivals, America, <laughs> hoping that they'd be somewhat down and that we are just oh, in a better no, phase. No, no, no. And I cannot be more wrong, yeah, bro. Yeah, yeah. America is basically, what I just said about Chivas, they're nearly double that. They are in an incredible form. Yep. They are stringing out amazing results while, while playing high-octane football. While uh, scoring from all cylinders, Zendejas going off, yeah. Henry Martin playing amazing. Yeah. The Diego midf- Valdez, Valdez just popping off, popping man. the fuck off. Good God. In one way, I'm disappointed because I'm a Chivas fan. I'm like, God damn, <laughs> fuck, dude, fuck, fuck. But on the other hand, I'm like, I'm actually really excited because now we're going to have a Clásico where both teams are looking really, 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 really good, good going in. Yeah. And that that's... Good for the sport. Where, that's good for the league. Where is it going to be at? Is it is it in uh, Guadalajara or is it in uh, the capital? The game is going to be in El Azteca. Ay, mm. that that's going to be one for America, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, bro. I have a, a small part of me really wanted this one to be in Guadalajara. Bro, they're on a nine game winning streak. Dude, they seem unbeatable, man. Yeah. Seriously, you watch yeah. the, you watch them play. Sure, maybe it'll be tight for 20, 30 minutes, but as soon as America get on the scoreboard, it's over. 
Because they're going to get one more. They're at least going to get one more. And can you score two goals against this America mm -hmm. side? That's when it gets mm -hmm. tough. So for me, again, for, so for me, Chivas' game plan has just to be keep this nil-nil as long as you can, and maybe you get like a solo goal from Vega or something like that. And I think that's going to be your best chance because once America get one, they smell blood, and they won't oh, stop yeah. scoring. Yeah. They well, won't bro, stop they, scoring. They, they played Man City, and it's like they took some of their powers, bro. The way they're playing. <laughs> it's fucking Man City-esque. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, way yeah, that yeah. they are winning games, bro. Yeah. I agree. They look very, very tough to beat. Yeah. Um, but if there is a Chivas squad of the past five years that is capable of maybe mm, pulling out a result, yeah. I would put my money on this squad. Okay. Because there's a little bit of a little bit of magic, man. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a heated fucking game. Yeah. It's going to be great to see. I hope that it just lives up to, to what I'm hyping it up to be. Yeah. But I'm excited, man. I'm excited to see El Clasico once again. I want to talk about the South American results that oh, I missed out on. Wait, do you want to? I, <laughs> <laughs> do you really want to go uh, there, man? Because it's a dark man. conversation yeah, if we do. This is a dark fucking conversation, <laughs> man. I, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked up, man. I, I placed bad juju on these fucking yeah, teams, man. Really bad. The last shoot we had, I made predictions, right? I made four predictions. Mm -hmm. And I'll go with my correct ones first. I correctly predicted that Arsenal would still be at the top of the table by the time I'm back at this seat. Okay. And they still are. I predicted that Chivas would be in the playoff race. Ah, you did, man. You did. I got that one right. So you let's did. give credit where credit's due. That's true. That's true. That's true. I also predicted that the Copa Libertadores final would be between Vélez and Palmeiras. Yeah. And then I follow that up by predicting that Melgar would make it to the Sudamericana final. Yeah. Now, brothers... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's remind him uh, of the first uh, leg scores. Yeah, man. yeah. Holy um, shit. Uh, Flamengo um, annihilated. Annihilated. Annihilated yeah. Vélez. Bro. In Argentina. In Argentina. Great. One of one of the most depressing, I think, scenes I've seen on that type of big stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it yeah. Tr for for both Vélez and Melgar. It was a case of they made it too far. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, they yeah. shouldn't. You're they right, they, they shouldn't right. have gone to the semis because yeah. they simply were not ready for the type of competition that they were going to have to face. Yeah, they they they, they were not yeah. ready. Um, what what really depresses me about the Vélez situation is because dude, that stadium was alive at the beginning of the game. It wanted, it wanted, they wanted it yeah. so bad. Even even if it was like a 1-1 one, one draw or hell, even a 1-0 one one, loss yeah, yeah. or something like that like would have been respectable and they would have been proud of their team. And this was a moment for Velez to... To give back to the community, man. It really was. <laughs> People were going to church. Yeah, man. The game. No, they People were. At the market. Like, it was a buzz going into the game, bro. It was a buzz bro. going into the game. And you, you had families Jesus. like, I, I want to see Vélez win. I, I want to see Vélez yeah. go to the Vélez, final. Like, la final. Like, go, yeah. la final like, Vélez. Copa Libertadores, man. And this was a defining moment, but in the, the worst way. In the worst way, because, dude, like, I can just picture myself being like 10 years old, going oh, to this God. game, bro. Don't go there. Going to this game. Don't go there. And, like, if Vélez had gotten a good result, I would have been like, I'm training every day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna train every yeah, day because I wanna yeah. I wanna yeah. do the same thing that those players mm -hmm. did for me at this game mm -hmm. in the semifinal yeah, of the Copa Libertadores. It's a memory moment. It's right a core, there. It's a yeah, developmental. This, yeah, this is a cornerstone type of development for these young minds. Fuck, dude, instead, and, instead and, it's fucking trauma. It's trauma <laughs> to the point where at that point I'd be like. You know, maybe I should just stick to school. You know, maybe I didn't. Maybe I'm doing maybe, pretty good in history. Yeah, right? yeah. Maybe soccer's not it. No, because I can't. I can't do that on a weekly yeah. basis. And. It really was a defining moment, but again, in the worst way. But Flamengo. I'm telling you, once again, we're, we are reminded. That is a remind. That's a statement victory right there, My right God. there, reminding us of the ruthlessness. They came in like fucking like some <sighs> Game of Thrones shit. Yeah, where they come into a castle or a town yeah. and they just murder the people that live in that murder. fucking town. And, and, and they that's enjoyed what that it. Shit was man. They really enjoyed they, it. They had too. dragons and shit. Like they they, <laughs> they fucking uh, the victory they had was ruthless, man. Ruthless and. Uh, I mean, we didn't predict it, but we we have mentioned before how the same teams that were in the final last year yeah. are back. Yeah, they're back. And we kind of had this idea of like, well, can they really get there for a third time? Yeah. I, I I ultimately wanted to predict that they didn't, but it just makes sense that they just here. makes sense. Yeah, they're it makes so sense. good. They're man. so good, bro. They're, they're so well oiled, man. That yeah. fucking system they have in place is killer bro killer. when it works it fucking works man yeah. the the player obviously who really surprised me getting the hat trick pedro dude this guy is 
He's crazy. Uh, he actually reminds me kind of like Richarlison mm. in his attitude and the way that he plays. He's like deceptively skillful. The way you see him play, you think he's just a fiery character. You think that he's more physical than he is talented. But no, this guy has incredible skill. You see him chip the keeper. You see him just f have these deft touches, these really subtle finishes. And you're like, oh, this guy, not only is he athletic, not only does he have that fire, but he's very skilled. So the, the, I, the, there's a crazy stat. Did you see it? 12 goals in 12 matches. Fucking Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good Lord. Is yeah. he young? <laughs> he's, a tw he's 14 he's 25. years old. He's 25. So he's, 25. A, he's just hitting his prime, but he's hitting it hard. <laughs> <laughs> 12 goals in 12 matches just in the Copa Libertadores. Ridiculous. Re Ridiculous. Ridiculous, dude. He's going off. He's having the season of his life. And ultimately, I, th I think it will culminate in Flamengo yeah, lifting the title, man. Because on the other end, Let's go to the other side. On the other end, we have Atlético Paranaense, who honestly, I'm very proud that they made it. Wait, this. Well, bro, cause, okay, so that happened while I was gone, so I didn't get to see the game, and we just lost to Palmeiras on FIFA. So I'm truly wondering, <laughs> how the hell did this Paranaense team, who isolated as not capable of going to the final because of what I saw in the quarterfinals leading up to this matchup, wasn't convinced? You know, I understand why they won that matchup, but I ultimately just didn't see them as title contenders or even finals contenders. Yeah. What the fuck happened for Palmeiras that allowed Paranaense to pull it off, man? And yeah, just just to conclude that, I'm not convinced either by Paranaense, even though they did make it to the still? final. I'm still not okay. convinced. Right. But yeah, this is one of those games where we truly won't know who deserved it, man, because Palmeiras set the tone, getting an early oh, goal, okay. getting a really early goal in Sao Paulo, crowds rocking, and it... It looks like we're going to see Palmeiras yeah. get this lead back and ultimately take Paranaense down. But right at halftime, right before the halftime whistle, red card for Palmeiras. So they have to spend the entire second half down a man. Paranaense take advantage of that, ultimately barely see the game out. Still just up a man, but barely. And yeah, they're, they're in the final. And they... Uh, all things considered, sure, they did deserve it, but we'll never know if Palmeiras could have actually pulled yeah, it off if it was 11 yeah, v. 11. Yeah. We'll never know. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think Paranaense will give a good fight, but this is Flamengo's, man. Yeah. And if Flamengo don't yeah. win it, then they, 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 something bad would have happened in this upcoming history. final. History. No, history. <laughs> yeah, history, history for yeah. Paranaense, man. For Paranaense. Oh, bro. History for Paranaense. And that's the thing, off. though. That's the thing. If, if Paranaense somehow pulled this off, it'll be scenes. Yeah. Because this will be huge for a club like Paranaense who've been working their asses off these last six to seven years for it to like end with Libertadores glory. Jesus, My man. God. Fernandinho coming over and yeah, winning it in yeah. his first fucking year, That'd be dude. insane. That'd ridiculous. But, but it's not going to happen. But on the other hand, it's not going to happen. Flamengo wins it and it's a remind. It's, it's, a, it's a dynasty. It's a, it's dynasty, a dynasty. A South American dynasty Absolutely. at that point. And uh, yeah, I actually, I would, I would submit the same prediction, man. A uh, little disappointed that the final isn't until like 46 more days. Man. I know. I it's so fucking far it, away. It pissed me off. They have all the knockout games so tightly close together. Yeah. And then they just separate it to like a few weeks before the World Cup or some shit. The final of any tournament should never be more than two to three weeks away. Yeah. Three weeks yeah. max. If it's a month or more, which in this case it's, it is way more. It's it's for us. It, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You, there's no momentum for either side. I, low key, you kind of forget. The, there's no yeah, hype. Yeah, the excitement kind of dies and then you down. Have to, and then you have to rehype yourself. Like, oh, okay, that's right. <laughs> Flamengo's in the final. Like, my body gonna take so much, man. Yeah, it, it's very yeah. very annoying. And because I want that immediate satisfaction of yeah. knowing who's going to lift the title, especially seeing these scenes in the semis. But yeah, and then we we get we get cut short on that feeling. But yeah. if, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. In the other tournament, um, Melgar got. Got got. Fucking got. They, they got, got got by Independiente got got. del Valle. Uh, but the game that I was actually able to see once I got back to the States was the second leg of the Sao Paulo against oh. Atletico Goianense game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Which was actually a, I would consider a banger. It's a good game. Because Sao Paulo went into this match down three to one. Yes. And they're at home and they have an opportunity to score two goals and get back into this match. And... Uh, I don't remember the last time I saw such a one-sided fucking game, bro. Bro. Uh, the fact that Goyanense only conceded one goal in the first half was a win. <laughs> was a <laughs> yeah. win for them. Yeah. The fact that they can, didn't concede more. Because Sao Paulo was so dominant, was constantly pressuring them, and just, just, uh, just behind every single ball. Every single ball, they were on the tail end of it, always active, always in pursuit of another goal. 
Goyanitsa somehow managed to survive that first half, but going to the second half, you already knew they're going to get a second goal. Patrick scoring a brace in this game, tying the game up. Sao Paulo eventually got that goal, and it's 3-3. And momentum has literally just shifted over to Sao Paulo. I, I didn't see that first lick, so I have no idea how Goianense got three goals on these boys. But regardless, <laughs> it goes to penalties after 90 minutes, yep. and Sao Paulo comes out on top. Yeah. So we have a Sao Paulo versus Independiente del Valle matchup, and I'm going to be rooting for Sao Paulo because what Del Valle did to my boys is personal. <laughs> it's personal. It's personal. It's personal. I made a whole TikTok out of that shit, man. I embarrassed myself, bro. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think the thing is Del Valle was always going to be a tough one for Melgar just because Del Valle, are, at this point, especially in the Copa Sudamericana, these guys are veterans. They're like the Sevilla of the Europa League. It's the same thing. They're, they they yes. are the Sevilla of the, the Copa Sudamericana in yeah. that sense. Del Valle are very, very good when it comes to this caliber of opponents. And Melgar, having never really been here, especially t facing this type of opponents, they weren't ready. They yeah. simply Once were again. not ready. And they were not only second best, bro. Like, it, it, Del Valle brushed them aside like they weren't even there dude Melgar had no clue how to defend Del Valle it was, it was literally boys against men in that sense and the way that Del Valle picked Melgar apart man they stop man I, stop bro <laughs> Peruvians are going through enough man that was it that was all that remained that was all that remained and now it's Jesus Christ the, bro. the way they picked them apart has me very excited to see what they can do against Sao Paulo man okay. one of the one of the big plays that really stood out I I think he got a hat trick. If not, he got like two braces. Uh, Lautaro Diaz, I think, is his name. I think that's his name. Uh, Argentine striker coming from like the second division in Argentina. His first year in Ecuador with Del Valle. He's going off. He is going off. Looks to be a silky type of forward. Likes to ride that line. But when he gets that ball, makes that run, he's got that deceptive pace. Mm. He can blow by a player, but he's also a good dribbler. And then he, he's also... a low-key a good finisher so you're just like dang this guy low-key he can do a lot and especially at this type of level that can be the difference yeah, man yeah. i don't know I, I don't know if sao paulo have have an x factor like that i don't know if they do I, obviously they're very very good players and they have a very good team they're in the final for a reason but del valle might have more maybe a little bit more flair more, yeah, they more might have a, they might have a little bit more sauce a little bit more free-flowing style and in a final where maybe you just need that space and a player that can exploit that, maybe Del Valle get it, and I'll be rooting for that to happen. No, I'm going the other way this time. I'm going the other <laughs> way. I'm going Sao Paulo, man. I think Del Valle will do Paulo. it. Unbiased, I think Del Valle is the better team. Dude, so last week you did a, uh, you did an incredible, incredible review of the Belgian national team. Yeah, that was a fun one, man. I, I got deep into it, just the, the whole research aspect of it, but then seeing that research unfold it, right in front of my eyes, yeah. watching the games, yeah. very, very satisfying. Yeah, and we got some awesome feedback from uh, Belgian fans and supporters that yeah. really brought up some good points as well, but it kind of seems like the general consensus is kind of on the same boat of like, yeah, man. we don't really expect us to be title contenders. Maybe we're like top seven instead of what... What was thought to be like a top four, top three side based off of the FIFA rating. Yeah, but so, they're second right yeah, now. Everyone's kind of <laughs> on the same page. It's, yeah. it's, it's actually really interesting to see. So these fucking last two shoots where you all did them all alone, I feel like I was in a fucking stray jacket because I was fucking <laughs> watching the videos, bro, like on the train in Portugal. Yeah. And I was just begging to just say shit, bro. Yeah, be part and of I would it. end up just barking in public places like, yeah. fuck, like I just want to get my shit in, man. <laughs> it was frustrating, man. So I'm Welcome happy back. to be back here. Welcome back. And... We were talking midweek about what what national team do we want to talk about this up in, upcoming week because for now, what we plan on doing is kind of mentioning and, and diving deep into one certain national team uh, for the next few podcasting episodes. Yeah. And so this week's team is Spain. España. España. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> what a team to pick, man, because yeah. situationally, this team has so much depth. This team is completely different from what existed in 2018. That's stupid. And this team is shaping up to be a wild card in this World Cup. Yeah. They could be a complete and utter title contender, or they could be a round of 16 quarterfinal exit. Yeah. So we're going to dive deep into the landscape of this squad and just kind of what we predict will happen in the World Cup. But to start, where are you at with the Spanish national team? Just what are your immediate thoughts? Yeah, my, my immediate thoughts is actually exactly what you just said. Maybe I go one step further. For me, when I see the Spanish national team, when I see these 
23, 25, whatever, 30 players that Luis Enrique has called up in these last 12 months, I see a dark horse team here at the 2022 FIFA World Cup. And, you know, the definition of dark horse is a team that is unexpected to make a deep, deep run. And in doing so, they beat title contenders. They beat teams who are expected to go all the way because they're the dark horse. And I see, I see that 100% in the Spanish national team, man. And again, it kind of goes back to that depth point of view that you were talking about. But ultimately, I think that's going to define whether they actually fulfill that dark horse narrative or not. My biggest takeaway from watching the games that I saw this weekend in La Liga, my biggest takeaway that I saw from doing the research that, uh, that, from doing the research that I usually do in anticipation for these games is that Luis Enrique has a conundrum, man. Who the hell does he play? Who are going to be the 11 players out on that pitch that actually fulfill that narrative of being a dark horse? Because they can. Yep. If Luis Enrique finds the perfect 11, if he puts the right players in the right positions to succeed, the Spanish team yep. can go all the way. They can. But that's the thing. It's going to be completely down to the coach. And that's what's so interesting about the situation, yes, man, because sir. I don't think there's any other coach out of the 32 teams at this World Cup that has as many decisions to make as yeah, Luis Enrique. It's, it's overwhelming, bro. It's overwhelming. It's, over, it's like trying to find the the combination to a lock. Yes. There's so many different options at hand that I actually ultimately see being a burden and something that might stop this team yeah. from achieving something like a semifinal appearance or a World Cup uh, championship. So to dive into that, I want to th- I want to mention some of the players that Luis Enrique has as, at his disposal just so people can get an idea yeah. of the unreal depth that is uh, at the helm for this Spanish team. So defensively, here's a few names. Aspilicueta, yeah. Jordi Alba, Carvajal, uh, Cucurella, who hasn't That's played, but right. an option there. Laporte, uh, Eric Garcia, Gerard Piqué, um, Pau Torres, yes. Sergio Ramos. Yep. Uh, any, and then goalkeepers. Simon, who started for, for most of the Spanish national, national squad games. De Gea, and then two potential nominees with uh, David Raya from Brentford and uh, Sanchez, the Brighton, Brighton goalkeeper. Yeah, yeah. Defensively, have I missed any names? Not really, but I'm glad we started here because I do want to go back to front. So I want to start in between the sticks. Let's do it. Because recently, in pretty much every game, Enrique's gone with Simon. Yeah. He's chosen the 25-year-old from Athletic Bilbao to be his number one keeper. And it makes sense. United had a, you know, what a lot of people called one of their worst seasons last year, right? Even though it wasn't truly, truly that bad. And De Gea was a little exposed. But, yeah, but it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, De Gea was a little exposed. And I think Enrique really saw that. He envisioned that. And he said, all right, I'm, I'm going to go with Simon. Simon, obviously, coming through the ranks of Atletico, have produced so many good keepers. And he's just another one that they yeah. produced. And... Over, I, I would say over Ryan Sanchez, I think Simon has that mm-hmm. job. But what gets really interesting here is that let's say United just keep riding this wave of wins, man. What if, what if Ten Hag figured it out right now and they don't stop losing or they don't stop at least they, they remain like heavily undefeated yeah. for long stretches of time yeah. going into this World Cup and let's say De Gea really doesn't concede. Who do you pick? No, that, seriously. That gets really That really gets tough. really tricky because, yes, Simone has gotten the call up a lot recently, especially in these last 12 months. But when you think about a player who has played in probably the bigger games, when you think about a player who has reached a higher peak, it is David De Gea. It is. De Gea offers more experience. He started in the 2018 World Cup. And like you said, I agree. I think he has a bigger, uh, a bigger peak than Simone. He's capable of some amazing saves. Saves that oftentimes can control the outcomes of games. You remember seeing yeah. the hat get hot, bro? He, when, it, when the hat yeah. gets hot on his saves, bro, yeah. he, make, he makes some incredible jaw-dropping saves at he times. Does. He does. If he, he does. gets into that mode. And I don't know if I've ever seen Simone reach that level, right. but Simone is secure. He he's is. reliable, and he's a, no, he's a safe option, I feel like. So based off of what I've seen and how Luis Enrique has approached um, the Spanish national team in terms of selections, I think he's going to go Simone, man. Yeah, yeah. Solely because, right? Solely because he sees the talent, he knows he's secure, mm-hmm. and he just he, he values that, yeah. right? Is, that's what you're saying. I, I like, see it. There's yeah. like less drama too with like yeah. Simon. Yeah. Oh, dude, that is true because 
for De Gea to come into this national team, he's coming in as the number one Spanish keeper who's been the number one Spanish keeper mm -hmm. globally for a long time. So he kind of brings that, not necessarily ego, but that, that type of energy. Mm -hmm. A guy from Manchester United mm -hmm. is now going to be the starting goalkeeper for Spain, which is, which is completely different by choosing Simon in these last 12 months. It's completely mm -hmm. different. So you, yeah, you're def you definitely make a good point. Yeah, but I, I do think there's going to be some sort of pressure on Simon if he does end up starting because I think the footballing world expects the hair yeah. to start. Yeah. I think, I think that's what they expect. So if Luis Enrique makes a bold decision to start Simon, there's going to be pressure on him and his first World Cup appearance to, to you know, provide stability back there. Yeah. And will he be able to do that? Time will tell. Exactly. So that, there's already an interesting decision to make. <laughs> exactly. At the at, fucking, and the, the one position. There's only one, one position. position. That should be the easiest, It man. should be the easiest one, bro. <sighs> so if we move just up, just yeah. right in front of the keeper, the center back position, this this just gets even hairier, yeah, it man. Yeah, insane. Because you have, again, let's just list them out. True players who could actually start at the World Cup yep. for Luis Enrique. Yep. You have Cesar Espilicueta, yep. Aime Eric Laporte, Eric Garcia, Pau Torres, and recently... Recently, Luis Enrique has been playing and starting Inigo Martinez, mm -hmm. the Athletic Bilbao center defender. So <laughs> that's five, five starting center backs that, they could, that uh, Luis Enrique can choose from, and we still haven't even mentioned Sergio Ramos. Or, P or Pique. Or Pique. And that's, that's where it gets really interesting is because it kind of makes sense. Ramos hasn't been called up for over a year now, but it's because he's been riddled he's, with yeah, injuries. He was injured this past season. Truly, yeah. truly injured last year to where he, was, he wasn't playing because he couldn't. And so Enrique couldn't really pick him. He had no choice to. But it kind of reminds me of the De Gea situation in the sense that if he does pick Ramos, he'll be picking a guy who has led Spain to glory long before, a true veteran in that sense. Mm -hmm. And how many times have we seen international coaches have the option to choose a veteran and not choose them solely because they think it's better for the vibe of the squad, solely because they think it's just better for the squad as a unit, right? We don't... You, it, it, Chicharito. Yeah. <laughs> you, you make a statement by not picking that veteran. You basically yeah. say, look, we don't need to rely on the players of the past. We are who we are today, and we can yeah. win. It sets a precedent. It sets a precedent. precedence. Yeah. Exactly. So even though Ramos has gotten off to a really good start with PSG really this good, year... Man. I actually would not be surprised if Enrique doesn't call him up. But that's the thing, though. I wouldn't be surprised, but I would criticize him. I would criticize him. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. bro. Because Ramos looks good, man. Yeah. He looks really good. You can use that IQ, man. Anybody would use that IQ if you had that at your disposal. Oh, man, and, and for Enrique not to choose it? Yeah. Yeah. And if you could, if you ranked all the players at the World Cup with the most experience, Ramos is in like that top 3%. Yeah. Like if you just ranked it off of all the players at the World Cup, he is at the very, very top. Yeah, he's right underneath like, Messi and Ronaldo. Yeah, like he's that's right, it. It's <laughs> Messi, Ronaldo, yeah. Ramos. This would be like his fourth World Cup, I think, at this point. Yeah. So like I would criticize him. If Ramos continues his form, I'm criticizing that. Absolutely. I think he has, I think he has to start if, if he's at that level. And that's where it gets really crazy because any of those players alongside Ramos – could start and be very, very effective. What's really interesting about Enrique's options that he has is they're all pretty much the same caliber yeah. of defender, but they each have their own attributes. If you need a guy who's like a dog who will fight, kind of give you a barbarian type of attitude, you pick Inigo Martinez. But if you want a guy who showed for you up in the Euros, had a really good season that year with Villarreal, you know you you know you have that in Pau Torres, yeah. but then you still have Chelsea legend Cesar Espilicueta to mm -hmm. choose from too. Amerik Laporte, obviously a go-to guy for Pep when he's healthy at Manchester City. Who do you yeah. start, man? I think the one player that you don't start is is Garcia. Yeah, probably Garcia, who yeah. has started a few games for Spain in the past year. So yeah. I, I think that's a player that we won't see at the World Cup. Yeah. Personally, I don't think he I don't think he needs to be anywhere near that starting lineup. Yeah, uh, and, but you're right. Yeah, yeah the, the proposition at hand is insanely tough. But you're right. There, there really is no true downgrade. It's matter exactly. what it's, mix <laughs> creates the the yes, strongest formula. It's preference at that point. It truly comes down to Enrique's preference and who he thinks can fit in better to better suit mm -hmm. the formula that he's trying to create. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and which because is it could crazy. be it could be like <laughs> Piqué and Ramos. It could right? be at center back, <laughs> or it could be or it could be Laporte and Torres. Yeah, it could. And, and I and I actually think that they both. 
both sets of center backs would be quality, yes. quality center backs. So yes. that in itself is such a mind game. It's such a headache for yes. Luis Enrique to figure out. I think he's one of the coaches whose starting lineups from this past year is going to look the most different in comparison to what he actually starts at the World Cup, man. Yep. We might and we might not the line he might play with at the at the World Cup might have not played like in the past four years together. <laughs> yeah, just because man. of how timing and everything worked out. <laughs> yes, bro. So ultimately, in those two spots, who do you have? Who would you go with? Oh, God, I think I I'm gonna go ahead and say he's not gonna pick Ramos. I really don't think he is. I feel like Enrique has his preferences, and right now, Ramos is not that preference. I think he's gonna go with Aspilicueta, and. At center back? At center back. Okay. And I think I think he's going to go with Aspilicueta for sure. And to pair with him, he's either going to choose, oddly enough, Inigo Martinez or Pau Torres. Now, Laporte, man. I feel like he started Laporte a lot. <sighs> he, I feel like that's almost more secure, in my, in my opinion. Possibly. But, dude, he's also played Martinez a lot mm-hmm. in these last, like, what, six games? A lot. Which is interesting. It's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. So it's so hard to pick what Enrique is actually gonna do. Yeah. If I had to, if I had to pick, I would pick Aspilicueta and at I, center uh, back. Yeah, at center back. Okay. Well, because he he plays that role for Chelsea. Yeah. Aspilicueta can play out wide, and that's the yeah. thing. Enrique, if he wants to have a defensive fullback, he can. Mm-hmm. But Aspilicueta, especially in these last few years with Chelsea, has been a center back, and I think that's where he plays best. I I ultimately think that. A pairing of Laporte and Ramos is the best. I know that we won't see it though. Right. I know. I, I like. I'm almost 100 percent sure we won't see that. But I'm going full on quality here. Mm. I think Ramos brings in uh, so much experience, but also a combination of, of quality. And I think he's better off being paired with someone like like Laporte instead of Piquet because Piquet has shown somewhat inconsistencies this season. He's been benched at times, yeah. and he hasn't gotten the amount of minutes that. He usually gets, but it's mainly because of his age. I That's think he's thing. declined a little bit. PK might not even be called up yeah. at this point, especially yeah. if he goes with those other four players ahead of mm-hmm. him. Yeah. And so for me, a, a Ramos-Laporte combination would be incredible. You got a Man City and PSG center back yeah. just teaming up. Like I don't that, see how that's that, a bad decision. That there. does sound nice, um, actually. <laughs> but realistically, I see Laporte, and I'm going to predict Torres. I yeah. think Pau Torres. Yeah. yeah. Because Pato is, is also a stud, man. He's phenomenal. He's a, he's a very, he's very good yeah. one-on-one defender. Yeah. And that's the thing. If, if he prefers that, he chooses Torres. It just yeah, de- de- it, de- de- yeah. it depends on what yeah. he prefers, man. Yeah. Um, but one position, I think, in that back line that probably is secure if he's healthy, right back, Dani Carvajal. Yes. I think that's yeah, secure if he's healthy, which I hope he is because that'll only just uh, that'll I, only help Spain's chances yeah. of being that dark horse. I wonder how... I wonder if Enrique's low key wishing for some injuries to make his job easier, bro. <laughs> Jesus, fucking dude, imagine, you know, imagine, bro. Like he's like, please, please make my make job it somewhat easier, easier yeah. man. Yeah, you're right. No, Carvajal, I think, still has so much quality to give. Mm-hmm. He's shown it time and time again, week in, week out. Yeah. He's very much secured that spot, in my opinion. Um, but on the other side, you have interesting options. Uh, Jordi Alba Jordi would Alba. be the somewhat safe and experienced move to go with it's experience but he's around 33 years old now yeah he's a, little, he's a bit of a different he's getting player up there. Yeah. he's getting up there but then again you also have a really interesting wild card with cucurella who's been on an insane rise the yeah. past two seasons now, yes and has found himself a basically starting position at chelsea uh do you consider cucurella who hasn't even played in any of spain's games i believe he hasn't he yeah. has not played and that's what worries me is I think we're going to see what type of coach Enrique is yeah. when he picks his squad. Is he a guy that just kind of sticks with what he knows? Or does he take a risk and pick a guy he's never called up before? And Mark Cucurella. That's such a risk. Dude, it's he's such a never... risk. He's never, he's never dealt with him. And to do it now, it's tough. But I think it'd be the right decision. I think Cucurella is on that form right now. Yeah. He's firing on all cylinders. He's the typical Spanish technical player. He would fit in like that's, a that's glove. The thing. That's, that's the Cucurella's thing. kind of selling point is that he's so able to just fit into any squad. Exactly. Alpha, it, game one with Chelsea, he looks so comfortable, man. Like I think he is that type of player. So if there's a player to take a risk on, yeah. I wouldn't mind that being Cucurella, bro. Especially yeah. over a... a a Jordi Alba, who's just a little bit less un- uninspired nowadays, yeah. I feel like. He, had, he used to have a more of a drive to him. Yeah. And Cucurella is everything is is all drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all, yeah, he has guess, one oh, gear, and it's just like, go. Yeah, He's just like, let's go. Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and then other yeah. alternatives yeah, that other he options. could go with 
maybe Juan Bernat, the PSG mm-hmm. fullback. Mm-hmm. He gets minutes at PSG. He's very good on the ball, but kind of like Alba, maybe not the most efficient offensively. Yeah. And so if I had to pick who Enrique is probably going to go for, it's probably going to be Jordi Alba. Yeah. I'll be completely honest. Yeah. Although if he picks Cucurella, man, I think I just think it'd be the better choice. <sighs> yeah. So, okay, so that in, in, in rounding up the whole back line, let's go over the predicted line. Mm. Not what we want, but the predicted line. Alba, left back. Alba. Who are we going to go with at center back position? I, th- I do think Aspilicueta is going to play. He <sighs> has to. So, he has to, bro. Aspilicueta doesn't not play when he gets called up for Spain. He's there for a That's reason. That's true. That's true. He's yeah. there for a reason. Yeah. I think for me, it's I don't know who he's going to play alongside. I have no idea. Laporte. <laughs> I'll go I Laporte could, I, and Aspilicueta. I'm down for Laporte, that. Laporte, Aspilicueta, and then uh, right back Carvajal yeah. with Simon at the back. I think so. We're predicting for Spain I, right I now. think so. Okay. All right. <laughs> so we move forward in the hopes of finding somewhat uh, <laughs> stability. stability yeah. And we find everything but that. Yeah. Because Spain is one of the most stat countries in the midfield position. Bro. Spoiled. Spoiled, bro. Dude, the, the, the average technique of a spanish player unreal <laughs> dude what unreal. are they teaching those kids what man? the hell what bro? are they doing they're, they're drinking prime bro <laughs> those kids are drinking prime <laughs> it's crazy <sighs> man. you on, honestly honestly you could convince me if you made a case you wrote down a thesis and i read it and you made a case that Luis Enrique needed to choose Iker Muniain, Oyan Sanset, and Alex Berenguer, all three athletic Bilbao players to play the midfield. I'd be like, I, I could see it. Yeah. I could see it. Because they're that technically sound. Because they're that technically yeah. sound. I'd be like, yeah. maybe that's the key to unlocking maybe. the front three. Maybe. Maybe. And I'd be like, yeah, sure, I'm convinced. That's how deep the Spanish midfield could be. Yeah. If Enrique wants yeah. to kind of spoil himself. Yeah. Um, names. I'm going to throw some names. Rodri. Mm. Coque, yeah. Soler, yeah. Pedri, Gavi, Busquets, Thiago, Dude. Llorente, yeah. Muñain. Yeah, yeah. Throw them in there. Um, any other ones? Technically, Pablo Fornaz, maybe. Fornals, He's yeah. been getting kind of called up, but he hasn't really been playing, though. That's mm-hmm. the other thing. But again, just very technical players that they, that they can call up. Yeah. I know that Enrique, not recently, but has called up Brian Diaz from AC Milan. If he keeps getting good form... Maybe we see Brian Diaz too. So it's just interesting. It's, it it yeah. is interesting. One player that I think will start no matter what is Rodri. Over Busquets? I think Busquets not going to play. I think <sighs> Busquets' time yeah. is yeah. uh, kind of like Pique. Yeah. And honestly, maybe even kind of like Ramos in a, in a sense. I think Busquets' time is done as a starting midfielder for Spain. Um, I think Rodri I think, yeah, Rodri is, too. is the yeah. defensive midfielder that's going to be in that pocket to play alongside two other creative mm-hmm. midfielders. I think Enrique kind of sees that too. In the last like four games in the Nations League, he's picked Rodri to be that anchor. And I mean, the way he's playing at City, man, yeah, how, I, how can yeah, you not Yeah, play he him? hasn't done anything wrong at this point. Like, nah. He's done everything to earn that spot. Yeah. Um, right in his prime too. I think he does deserve it over Busquets, but it just... It does surprise me to see, uh, kind of, I guess the, not the downfall, but the, yeah, but the, the, yeah. the, 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 being Busquets get picked over is pretty nuts, man. That pretty nuts, nuts considering how long he dominated that specific position God. for the Spanish national team. A decade. And what he generated in terms of trophies and accomplishments. But Rodri's next man up, I think and so. he deserves it. I personally have a very, very, um, defined take on who should start alongside him on the left side. Okay. For me, I think Thiago has to have a starting position in this lineup if he is healthy. Because to me, I believe Thiago is a type of player when at full health is capable of being the best player on the pitch on any given day. Yeah. He can match up with anybody. He can bring in his Tekker style of football. Yeah. And he can completely show out if he is healthy. Yeah, yeah. He, that's what he's capable of. That's his height. That's the selling point on Thiago is his God-given ability on the ball, mm-hmm. his ability to protect the ball, his ability to see lanes, to sling that ball out when needed and do it in the most creative way p- ways possible. He can change a game. He can change he, From the game. midfield, he can, he can change, change a game. game. I would compare him to a, a Kevin De Bruyne type of player in effect. Yeah. Um, and so for that, I am, I am uh, adamant that if Thiago is healthy, 
I don't care who started there before. <laughs> I don't care who has. Who, yeah, yeah. I don't care who uh, Enrique has promised is going to have that position. Right. I think Thiago has to start for the Spanish national team on the left mid side. Completely agree. If he's healthy, which I actually do have my concerns mm-hmm, about that, mm-hmm. but obviously that's not in anybody's control, unfortunately. Uh, if he is healthy, I think Thiago does have to start, and he would start alongside Rodri purely because of everything you just said, class, yeah. w- world-level skill, all that. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. And then so that for me then brings an incredible debate into who comes into the right midfield position because we have like <laughs> 10 players ten lined players. up for one spot. Lined up for one fucking spot, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think I have my pick. Yeah, what, what do you have? I think I have Gavi, man. I, I really do. So one of the games I caught this weekend was Barcelona against Cadiz. Yeah. And Gavi was everywhere. Truly a Barcelona product. And obviously Enrique, being an ex-Barcelona coach, I think, I think likes that. He yeah. sees that and he's like, okay, I, I like what this kid has to offer. And he's already playing at such a high level. Let's bring him into this national team already. And I think Gavi obviously has the skill, the ability to play right alongside Rodri and Thiago, hopefully if he's healthy. But also, I think you would pair really well with him because Gavi's offensive-minded as hell. Sure, he's not going to get that final assist or he's not going to be the goal scorer, but he's going to be a part of every single build-up play. He has the technique, but another thing that I really like about Gavi is that he's attracted to the ball, man. He almost needs to get a touch in. It's crazy. He occupies kind of that right side a lot for Barcelona, yeah. and you'll see him out on that side. But if he doesn't get a touch over like the course of three, four minutes, he, he'll slowly <laughs> go towards the ball. <laughs> like a and, magnet. Yeah he's, a ma- yeah, he's magnetized to it, man. And he just gets his touch in. He gets involved. Yeah. And if anything, that can help isolate maybe the winger on the other side. You make a big switch, and then you have a one-on-one. So I think Gavi's ability offensively is just it's creative. It's almost kind of like an X factor effect. And when you have ball passers and ball possessive players like Rodri and Thiago to kind of feed Gavi. And then from there, Gavi can feed the front three. I think that's hella effective, man. I really do. And when you look at other players that maybe could play there, I know Coque and Carlos Soler have been occupying that position a lot. But when I think about true, true creativity, even Soler, I think Gavi's better. I do think he's better, even though he's a lot, lot younger. But again, it'll be what it'll be what Enrique prefers because Coque has been playing a lot. He's yeah, been well, get, he's yeah. been starting yeah. a lot alongside Rodri, and it'll be interesting because it'll just be completely down to preference once again. Does Enrique want to kind of expose that midfield a little bit, let Gavi do his thing where he just roams free, or does he want a guy in Coque who <laughs> knows yeah. the central yeah. midfield position like no other? Either one is really good to have. It'll simply be, what do you want? We go back to the formula case. Like, what is he trying to what create? What is he trying to create? Um, I would I would like to see Gabi there. Yeah. I, I actually do think that in terms of what we are predicting he is trying to create, Gabi would be the best fit because you have so much security in having Rodri right yeah, behind you. Yeah, you do. You do. You have so much security. You do. Thiago is also very well defensively, I, I, I would argue. And so I think that there is a lot of... There's, a, there's almost like a freedom that you can give to that right midfielder specifically. And to give it to a guy like Koke provides security, but it's almost like, do you need that at this point? All you right. do need a little bit more creativity. You kind of need a more attack-minded player, uh, a player that can get that final assist, who can <laughs> penetrate, who can yeah, get man. an amazing touch, can get out of tight spaces. Yeah. I, I do see Gabi having a prominent role on this team if Enrique instills his, his faith in them. Yeah. For me, what, it, what this question brings up, though, is... What do we see as Pedri's role? Do we see it as a midfield role or more of a wing role? Do you see him up front? That's what's crazy, too, because if, let's say, Thiago's not healthy, I think I would go with Pedri. And, but the, the problem is, is that that's so different stylistically. Yeah. That's yeah. so different. That's a completely different player. Um, but again, it is what kind of Barcelona are going with. When everybody's healthy, it, <laughs> it seems like Xavi is using De Jong as the anchor, and then he really likes yeah. Gavi, and then it's usually Pedri if he's healthy. Yeah. Oddly enough, Pedri <laughs> does get injured a lot, un- mm-hmm. unfortunately. If he's healthy, I think Enrique probably would prefer Pedri to be in that midfield, simply because I think you just want more out-and-out wingers or more offensive, direct-minded players to be in that front three, whereas Pedri really is a creative he, he, yeah. He's more of a creative yeah. midfielder rather than, than, yeah. than anything else. But, man, that's a lot of faith to instill into these less than 20-year-old kids, bro. It's crazy. A World Cup appearance to, to have two of your three midfielders be under 20 years old that's in crazy. a World Cup is a lot 
a lot, man. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. Um, and I know that we built up Gavi and Pedri to be these mentality monsters because I do think they are. But part of me is just like, man, like, I don't know. They're still kids, man. Yeah. Like, ah. I think realistically, <sighs> let's say Thiago's, it's a lot of pressure. if Thiago's injured, it'll most likely be Coque, Rodri, Gavi. And if, if Pedri comes off the bench and has a hell of a game, maybe he changes it in the next game. Yeah. It'll be one of those. He's just going to have to feel this out. So we're kind of bringing it down to that midfield to, I guess, five players and Pedri, Coque, Rodri, um, Busquets. Oh, not Busquets. Uh, Thiago and Gabi. Gabi. Those five is kind of what he's going to end up fiddling with. It, for me, it has to be that yeah. simply because these guys are elite, man. Yeah, I think elite. from there, it's a, it's a bit of a drop off to the next guy like Soled so. or, yeah, it or is. Um, it is. Llorente maybe. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I do think those would be the top five to go to. So ultimately, you predicted who is going to be the starting three for Spain? If Thiago's healthy, Thiago, Rodri, Gavi. I agree. If he's not, it'll be Coke. I agree. And that's what I want, too. So, yeah. nice, to, nice to see that. Nice to see nice that. To a little bit more <laughs> yeah. certainty. In right. A little bit more certainty yeah. in the midfield. Yeah. Hopefully, man. <laughs> wow. Finally, we have the dramatic Spanish offense coming to the forefront now with players like Alvaro Morata, yeah. uh, Sarabia from PSG, De Tomas, Yermi Pino, Oyar Sabal, potentially. Marco Asensio, if you want. Dani Olmo. Ferran Torres. Yeah. Uh, Ansu Fati. Yeah. Gerard Moreno. Oh, that's right. Iago Aspas. Sheesh. Once again, we find ourselves in the pickle. <laughs> ah. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Mind if I make an argument to start? Yeah. So, one thing that I realized in the planning of this uh, analysis is that I realized that, like, in, in, in ways that no other World Cup has ever um gone has never experienced i think this world cup will be very very different first off because yes it is like in the winter time so it's happening in the middle of basically football it's happening yeah. in the middle of the season for all these all these players um whereas usually we would have the world cup in and then about a month long break and then the world cup starts everyone starts off in the same page we now have a world cup happening where you can kind of gauge where a player or how a player is going to perform at the World Cup because there's a bigger indication of what form they're going oh, to be. Oh, in. yeah, dude. Form is going to play a huge role yep. in the selection of players and in the results of, of these teams at the World Cup. Yep. And so with that idea in mind, that theory of form coming into play, Enrique has to consider Iago Aspas. <laughs> Iago Aspas, hear me out, hear me out, hear me out, because I know already, already, I'm already generating some, some, <laughs> some, some uh, flack. Iago Aspas has scored double-digit goals oh, yeah. in La Liga since the Obama administration. Yeah. He's been doing this for like well over seven fucking years. Yep. I understand. He's 35 years old now. He's old. Mm-hmm. He is an old man. He played in the 2018 World Cup, and honestly, he didn't have a good World Cup, but I would honestly bring that down to Spain's system not being well-suited to his style of play. No, that 2018 was weird. It was very weird Spanish really team. Really weird Spanish Overall, team. and not suited well for many players on that yeah. team, which is why they got knocked down in the round of 16. Now we have an opportunity to have a Spanish striker up top that is capable of creating chances in the box, feeding teammates, but also just knowing when to finish, how to score that clinical goal, yeah. how to just... Uh, finish a team off in that sense. And I understand people are going to bring up the argument, you know, Iago Aspas is, is really old. He's really old <laughs> compared to most players, True. but he's got five goals and one assist in five games in La Liga already. Oh, yeah. He is once again showing that he's on pace to go double digits and that he still has it in him. I'm watching this guy play, bro, week in, week out of Celta, v- Celta Vigo, yeah. and I don't see any reason to not consider him, honestly, at least for the opportunity to potentially be on the bench, man. I think Iago Aspas is deserving of a call-up. Um, and I think that it almost be something out of respect for what he's been able to achieve in La Liga and for the Spanish national team because, in general, I feel that he is an underrated player oh, in yeah. the Spanish realm of football. When you, when you talk about MVP, most valuable player, Iago, Iago Aspas is arguably one of the most valuable players in La Liga for his club, Celta. Yeah, you're right. Without Iago Aspas, Celta Vigo will probably get relegated, yeah. man. The amount of goals that he's given to this club year in, year out is incredible. Kind of like Cristian Suani did for Girona for so many years. Um, so in that regard, I completely agree. And in, that, in, in the second regard, Iago Aspas, if there's one thing he's good at, it's finishing. He is a clinical finisher. 
when you compare him to the competition that he has in the Spanish Spanish national team, I would say there's two guys maybe ahead of him, and that is Alvaro Morata and Gerard Moreno. The only thing I think that Morata and Moreno, especially Moreno, have over Aspas is the ability to link up with their teammates. And the thing is, that it's not builds. it's not Aspas' fault mm-hmm. because it's not how Celta play. Celta are on a possession-based team. They're very direct. Honestly, their go-to directive on the pitch is get the ball to Aspas yeah. in advanced positions. Yeah. So that's how Aspas plays, and that's why he gets a lot of goals yeah, because they feed him in that yes. in that manner. Like high usage. Like, yeah, yeah, high usage. Yeah. yeah, they really get a lot out of Aspas yeah. very efficiently. I think my only thing is is that Enrique doesn't play that way. Again, once again, an ex-Barcelona manager, he does like the possession side of football. Yeah, that's true. And Moreno and Morata, and I, again, I would say Moreno even more so, they play in systems that kind of value link-up play. They play in systems that value build-up. Maybe even if it's just as simple as like knocking it back backwards to a, a midfielder and then you make a run. Mm-hmm. Aspas doesn't really do that because he doesn't have to. I'm not saying he can't do that because he absolutely can. He's very technically gifted. But as far as fitting into a system, I think Morata and Moreno probably fit into Enrique's system a little bit better. Although I would like to see Aspas make bench appearances. To, so I, in that regard, I actually do agree. If Spain need a goal... You you bring on yeah. Iago Aspas, yeah. and so absolutely, if you need a guy who just is really good at scoring, kind of like how when Andre Pierre Gignac played in the Euros for France in 2016, yeah, yeah. they solely used yeah. him when they needed a goal and there's 20 minutes left yeah. because Gignac's a really good goal scorer. Yeah. I think Aspas can play a very similar role. When Spain need just a goal, it'd be great to have Aspas come off the bench, and, what, and I would actually like to see that. Yeah, I know. Sometimes when I when I make my takes, I start getting. Uh, lost in the sauce and I get carried away. And I feel like in this one I was getting Don't carried away. All? I just kept going, bro. I just kept going. I was like, yeah, Iago Daspa doesn't just deserve a call up. He deserves respect from Spain. He deserves a starting position. I agree. I, I think the a bench position would be worthy of what he's been able what I think so. would be worthy of what he's provided. Uh, but it'll also be a smart move because like you it said, if you need that fucking goal, you go to him. You go to but him, yeah, bro. I think the the starting position up front you think is between Morata and Gerard Moreno? I do think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, for a while, I thought maybe Iglesias, Borja Iglesias could get in there, but now, nah, I mean, Aspas is miles Borja. ahead of ahead of him. Um, but do you see Moreno being able to get in front of Morata? That's the thing. It, it really just seemed like Enrique likes Morata yeah, in that number nine position. Yeah. And maybe it's just, again, because Morata's maybe a little bit more physical. Maybe he's bigger, but he's also good with the link-up play. Maybe he I, values that. Moreno's is like a little really weaker. Similar, man. Yeah, they, they are. Similar players. Moreno is a lot more silkier, though. But honestly, in some ways, to his downfall, to where he does get shrugged off the ball a yeah. lot. And he isn't the best of finishers. But what's weird is that Morata isn't either. And yeah. it, it completely comes down to form, in my opinion, when it comes to this. But I think Enrique just recently has been Morata, Morata, yeah, Morata, yeah, Morata. So, so I think Morata is going to get the start, at, the, at least at the start of the tournament. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I got to go with you on that, too. I think Morata gets to start. Um, now the question is, who joins him on the flanks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we now have players like Ansu Fati, who's returned from injury. Yes. Getting a lot of, um, a lot of a, 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 honestly, a fan push to start. I, I was looking through YouTube mm. comments on Spain's, like, recent uh, uh, just performances. Like highlights videos. A lot of well. people are just, at the time Ansu Fati was injured, a lot of people were like, just wait till Ansu Fati is back. He might be what Spain needs to like change their entire dynamic offensively. Yeah. And I do think he's that type of player, but there's other options. There's other options with Ferran Torres as well being considered. Do you, do you bring in Marco Asensio? Um, does De Tomas get a call up? Right. What, what ends up being the, the final move for Enrique to, to just conclude this starting lineup. Yeah, for me, this position goes down to what you just said a while ago in the sense that this tournament really is going to show us players who are in form and players mm-hmm. who aren't. Mm-hmm. I think a player out of form right now, Ferran Torres, man. He is, he's not looking good right now with Barcelona. He really isn't. Torres has been getting a lot of rotation yeah. minutes, especially since Barcelona in the Champions League. So yeah. when Xavi needs to rest his starting wingers, he's starting Torres, but... Tor- oh, yeah. Torres is not even, looking even good, just man. Recent this past week, and uh, he played, and he's just slightly off in he's everything. Off, His finishing dude. is just off. It's just slightly off. It goes a little bit over the bar, yep. a little too much to the side. And I feel like it's been like that ever since like his final days at Man City, bro. 
I haven't seen him score since the Trump administration. Maybe <laughs> if I keep going with that theme. <laughs> that it's been a while, man. I think for you no, know, absolutely. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't seen Torres play well since he was at Man City. Yeah. I'll be completely honest. His move to Barcelona has not worked out for him. Maybe it's the style of play. I don't know what it is, but Torres is out of form. I wouldn't pick him uh, at I, all. I will harp on him a little bit. I don't I just I've never been I've never seen it with Torres. Mm. I never really mm. have seen it. Yeah. So I don't know if he's just kind of being exposed a little bit for just not being the type of player that people thought he was. I, I still think he is very good, but I don't know if he's Barca caliber at this point. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know? absolutely. But um, but a player that I do think is, I think he's going to get in, is Ansu Fati. I think Ansu Fati gets in. I know that he has his injury issues as well, but I think his style of play will fit this sort of dynamic Spain possession based offense. He's a Barcelona player, like we pointed out as well. Yeah. And when he has gotten the opportunities to play for Spain, he's done really well. Yeah. I think that Ansu Fati, if if that position is open, I I think he gets slotted in. Yeah. I, I definitely definitely could see it. You know, what's it been interesting is that Enrique has really gone with Dani Olmo mm. a lot. Like yeah. surprising a surprising amount. And it's again, it maybe it comes down to the preference where he likes that an inverted winger who doesn't really hug that touchline, comes in a lot, gets active centrally, even from outside. Maybe he prefers that, but is Olmo in the best of form right now with Leipzig? I don't know. It'll again, I think it's just gonna yeah. come down to who is in form. And if Ansu Fati starts getting really good minutes, gets very involved with this Barcelona squad. Uh, in these coming months leading up to the World Cup, I would probably enjoy it more if Fatih started over Dani Olmo. But on the other side, I think there's only one player that's going to start wide right, and that's probably going to be Pablo Sarabia. Mm -hmm. I really do think so. He's pretty much cemented that position as the right winger for Luis Enrique as that starting position. And I honestly, I don't know who else is more solid. I'm not saying Sarabia is the go-to guy in that position, but... I think this kind of shows you that if Spain do have a weakness, it's probably their wingers. Probably. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, last thing I want to mention is I, I could also see Pedri somehow getting into the winger position. Maybe. He's done that at Barca. Right. If he, uh, maybe low key, kind of like how Dani Olmo plays as a winger. Yeah. Maybe he just goes with Pedri, who's probably low key like a little Diego's bit better. If healthy, then and he doesn't you have push a spot, him up. you push him up. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but still, the, the problem remains that on that right wing position, you really only have Pablo Sarabia, who gets bench minutes at yeah. PSG. Right. And for the rest of the quality on this squad, that's not good enough. That's the thing is that when Sarabia does play, I mean, he's good. He's, he, he doesn't do bad when he comes off the bench for PSG. And obviously, Galte trusts him to constantly mm -hmm. play off the bench, mm -hmm. right? He knows that Sarabia is the next best player outside of Neymar and Messi and Mbappe. Mbappe. Yeah, yeah. That, that says something. It says something. And he does have faith in him when he does bring him on constantly. And so, again, you see it on the pitch. Sarabia does well. But you're right. To... To match the quality yeah. that Spain have in the midfield, is Sarabia that guy? Probably not. But is it all you have? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't might know. Be all at his disposal there, or maybe he yeah. inverts one of these guys. Like maybe exactly. He, get, he like, finds like you Ansu Fati to come on the right or something. Yeah. So finally, how do we predict the final starting three will be? Let's do that. I think it'll be Morata, Sarabia, and it, I think it'll depend on who's more informed, whether it's. Fati, Olmo, or Pedri. No Asensio? No, Asensio's not going to get any time, bro. He's not going to get any. Does I've, he get called up? I haven't seen Asensio play in four years. <laughs> <laughs> but does he get called up? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe simply because, again, if Spain do have a lack in depth, I would say it's in that top three. Yeah. I definitely would say that. But, yeah, I mean. Who, 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 I, I'm going. I think Pedri gets pushed up. I really yeah. do. I, yeah. I, I would, actually, I would be interested to see that. Left winger Pedri, uh, Morata up top. And then um, I'll actually, I just don't see Sarabia getting that, get ultimately getting that that selection yeah. to start. I just I see him as a bench player for this team, bro. I'm going like Ansu Fati, dude. Seeing this final eleven for the first match day of Spain is going to be yeah. 
telling, yeah. man. Yeah. It's going to tell me everything, everything I need bro. to know about what Luis Enrique was thinking leading up to this World yeah, Cup, bro. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be crazy. Yeah. I'm actually so excited to see that team <laughs> sheet, man. As soon as they call out Spain's 11, I'm be like, where bro, the yeah, heck? Yeah, Who's the starting, hell? man? Yeah, bro, I'm going to be hyped an hour before the game yeah, starts. Bro. Because I'm going to just be waiting for that lineup. That's going to define the game for <laughs> it's me. It's going to define the game. Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's, it's just loaded, man. Okay, so now that we got the players all lined up and we predicted how Luis Enrique is going to line these players mm-hmm. out, we have Spain and Group B with Germany... Costa Rica and Japan. Um, I think in general, most people expect Spain to get out of this group. For me personally, I actually have Germany topping the group and coming out in first with Spain coming in second. I've been saying this since our early predictions and yeah. I still stand by it. Okay. Okay. Um, you real quick, where do you, where are you at on who gets out in what position in that group? I, I think Germany are better. Mm-hmm. I do think they're better. They're, they're just slightly more along their developmental path than Spain are, but I'm still going to stick by it. I think Spain are a true dark horse of this tournament. All it's going to take is for Luis Enrique to figure out that combination. Okay. There is a tough path to the World Cup semifinals even coming out of Group E because the winner or even second place in this group faces off against first or second from Group F, right. which is a loaded group with Belgium, Croatia, Canada, and Morocco. Mm-hmm. Um, going on from there, I... Ultimately, when I make my final prediction for where I see Spain f- panning out in this whole tournament, yeah, we mentioned at the, at the beginning, Spain is a a lock waiting to be unlocked. <laughs> yeah, once Enrique, if he gets that combination right, he could be he could be at the forefront of a of a of a, a treasure, an act- an absolute jewel of a team yeah. could be at his hands. If he gets it right. My thing is, though, when I look at all the decisions that Luis Enrique has to make, it's overwhelming, bro. It is. It's overwhelming, and it's actually a bad thing. There's too many options to be made that I just don't see him making the right ones at the end of the day. I think it's almost like gambling. Like, his odds are just <laughs> yeah, lower. Yeah, he's, he's rolling dice, yeah. it, picking it's, center it's backs. High risk, high reward. <laughs> like, he, if he gets it right, he's going to get it right. But if he doesn't, man, I predict we see a Spanish team that gets out in the quarterfinals. I have them finishing top eight. Maybe it's a close game. Maybe they almost pull it off. Yeah, yeah, But I have Spain losing in the quarterfinals. Okay. Yeah, I think that's... Actually, that's really respectable, I think. Um, What I love about the group stage is that it is three whole games. And if there's a team that maybe needs all Mm, three games to figure it out before going into the knockout rounds, might be Spain, man. Absolutely Spain. And so if if they... Get that first game, and Enrique's like, yeah, this this ain't it. You know, I, I picked the wrong team. Uh, second game, he kind of tinkers a little bit. And by that third game, he's like, all right, I figured this out. And if they do enough to at least just get that top two in the group, I think Spain could be a really tricky team to face yeah, in the absolutely. knockout stage. Yeah. A super tricky team. And we actually saw how well they dazzled in this past Euros, man. Yeah. And honestly, they completely surprised me because I didn't really rate Spain going to the Euros based off their 2018 performance in the World Cup. So if they can kind of replicate what they did at the Euros, but couple the fact that they're a little bit more experienced and Enrique has a slightly better idea who of who of what players he can pick... I think Spain can do the same thing. They can dazzle at this tournament, potentially beat anybody that they face. But ultimately, I actually do have them finishing probably quarters as well. Damn. Yeah. No, no semis. Semis is tough, man. Yeah. Semis, that's top four. That really, really that tough. That is top man. four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, but they could. I'm they not could. saying they can. I think they do have the ability to. They I do. Just, they do. I just think there's too many things for Luis Enrique to figure out, which is why I want to turn mm. to our, our viewers. And I want to ask yeah. you guys, this is a big one. I want to get a lot of involvement here. Who starts for the Spanish national team? What is that combination that ultimately leads them to victory? I need to know what you guys know because this is yeah, yeah this is like the Zodiac Killer's jigsaw puzzle, man. Yeah. Like there, there's just so much to figure out here. It's a maze. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, guys, let us know. Let us know what you think. How far you think Spain will go? Are they a quarterfinal exit team? Are they a semifinal team? Or are they World Cup champions? Let us know now and... Uh, comment who you guys want us to do next yeah yeah well, i'm interested to see if we got a lot of brazil fans a lot of argentina fans whoever it might be who do you guys want us to analyze next as we head closer and closer to the world cup 
Outside of that, man, it's been a loaded give and go episode. It's been a fun one, man. It's been a fun one. Midnight shoot. We're shooting very late into the night. Midnight tonight. shoot. Midnight session. And uh, it was a banger. I feel like, yeah. Uh, producer Red's over here, <laughs> yeah. ready to go on his own trip, man. But nah, thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for listening on Spotify or wherever you are, Apple Music. Always appreciate y'all support. Happy to be back, man. We'll be cranking out more episodes now. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. So keep in touch, man. Keep in touch. DM me if you want to talk football on Instagram and always open to have a discussion. Man.